Okay, I think we have a critical mass. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second day of the conference on uncertainty and economic activity. Um, we have another set of terrific papers today. Um, so we very much look forward to picking up the very lively discussions we had yesterday. Um, I guess before I turn over to Cami, I'd like to just remind everybody to stay on mute when the speakers present and each speaker will present for 25 minutes followed by 10 minutes of Q&A and please feel absolutely free to uh, raise a virtual hand or type in your comments in the chat window at that point. So with that, um, let's dive into the first paper. Cami, please take it away. Sounds good. Um, give me one second, share the correct thing here. Let me know if you can see my paper, the, the slides. Good, thank you. All right, so um, thank you so much for having the paper on the program. Um, uh, this is a paper with uh, Elias Ferman, who's a PhD student here at UNC. Uh, Geng Lee, who works for the Federal Reserve Board, and Zahi Ben David. And this, what we'll uh, talk about today is um, just our opinion and not the, the opinions of the Fed. Um, the uh, question that we have in this paper um, is uh, actually is twofold. So first of all, we'd like to understand uh, why is it that households differ in the cross-section in terms of how uncertain they are when they form economic expectations? And the second question is whether or not this uncertainty that people have when they're trying to forecast future economic variables, this uncertainty impacts their behavior. Um, we sort of knew that, by the way, I keep seeing the people entering into the waiting room. I'm not sure if the other participants can see that. So I'm not gonna let them in. I'm gonna let you guys click admit. Cool, thanks Paul. Um, so, um, we, we, we knew that people different in their economic expectations in terms of both levels and uncertainty. This is from um, survey data from Dominance and Mansky from the 1990s. Um, and there's a literature on um, what are the, the uh, drivers and the consequences of people's differences in terms of their expectations levels. Okay? So the first moment of beliefs about future economic conditions. Um, but there's not a whole lot of evidence in terms of um, the drivers and the effects of, of uncertainty of the second moment of expectation. So when you have when you have somebody think about, for example, what will home prices look like in the next year, they're going to come up with a distribution of potential prices or, or returns to owning homes. And the um, we know a lot about, again, the, the drivers and the impact of the first moment of, the, of those distributions, but for the second moment, we don't have a lot of evidence. Now we have a lot of theory that tells us how uncertainty ought to link to economic behavior. And in particular, what we know from, from many models in economics and in finance is that if you are uncertain about the distribution of, uh, of some shock that in the future can impact your consumption. So if that shock comes from a distribution with uh, with wider variance, this is what I mean in this paper by uncertainty, just a wider variance, wider standard deviation. Um, then uh, we know that this ought to lead to precautionary behaviors, precautionary savings, uh, interest in liquidity, lower consumption today, and exposure to lower financial risk. But we don't have a whole lot of evidence on this, on whether indeed uncertainty about some future economic variable does lead to precautionary behavior. We have some evidence, but it's inconclusive and scarce. Um, and this is in part due to the fact that in the um, in the data for a long time we didn't have good measures of people's ex ante uncertainty about some future economic variable, um, with with some very few exceptions. So typically, pro the proxy for people's uncertainty about future economic conditions was was actually the ex post realized volatility of the quantity of interest. Let's say you know somebody's income growth. So we would measure their income growth volatility exposed and see whether somehow that correlates with their choices before we measure this volatility of income. Um, so, so again, we don't have a whole lot of clear evidence as to whether or not people plan their behaviors, taking into account their, their current uncertainty about some future economic variable. So this is what we're trying to look at in this paper. Uh, and we're gonna, we can do so because uh, as we'll see in a second, we have some really awesome data provided by um, a relatively new survey done by the um, New York Fed. 
Um, now, when we're going to look in the cross section of who in the population is more uncertain, which is the first part of the paper, uh, we're going to be guided in our analysis by, by some theory that we have from uh, actually from neuroscience and from psychology. It turns out that those literatures, neuroscience and psychology, they have studied the role of adversity on how, how people um, view the world. Um, and uh, the result is that if you have seen a lot of adversity in your environment, uh, which tends to come with instability in your own environment, say you grew up in a household or your parents were unemployed a lot of the time, uh, or there were you know, chronic issues with, with uh, perhaps uh, addiction or something like that. So if you're in this sort of adverse environment, it tends to come with a lot of instability in that environment. And it turns out that people project from this local instability of their own environment uh, to the overall world. Um, so what we're going to then take from this literature in, in, uh, in neuroscience and psychology is that if we look in the cross section of American households, the households that are going to be the most uncertain about future economic outcomes are probably going to be those who are coming from a more adverse in, um, uh, background or who are in a, in a more adverse situation. And by adverse, I mean, these would be people who have lower income or people who might live in counties with more unemployment uh, or people who have more financial fragility. Um, and, and I'll go through those proxies of, of adversity in, in more detail in just a little bit. Um, so this is, if you, if you wish, this paper is making, a, it's making two points. The first point is that, that again, uncertainty, the cross-section of, of individuals correlate with these, correlates with these people's adversity. It's, it's as if there is this extrapolation, if you wish, in the second moment of beliefs. People extrapolate from their local uncertainty to, so, to, to sort of more macroeconomic uncertainty. And the second point of the paper, as we'll see, is that uncertainty and expectations, the second moment of beliefs, actually correlates with behaviors, just like theory says. So more uncertain individuals, all else equal, end up exhibiting more precautionary behaviors. So let me tell you about the data. This is um, what you have here in the slides is actually a bit outdated. Right now we're re uh, revising the paper because we've added uh, about uh, six months more worth of data from, from 2020. But what I'm going to tell you today basically is what we're seeing currently in the, in, with the updated data set. So um, as of what you see here, the data is uh, coming from the New York Fed Survey of Consumer Expectations um, uh, that has been run since June 2013. Uh, we have the data up until April 2020 in, as of the slides. Um, there are about 1,200 people per month, and they're interviewed uh, about their economic expectations, about their own uh, income, for example, but also about a couple of macro related variables. Um, these people are tracked every month for up to 12 months, so we can change, we can observe how their expectations change. Um, and then for every one of, of these individuals, when they're asked about their macroeconomic expectations or beliefs about their own income, uh, we have entire distributions for these expectations. So not only we know point estimates, um, but also we have uh, standard deviations which is what in this paper we refer to as uncertainty and expectations. And we're going to look at beliefs about three uh, economic conditions. Like I said, one is personal income growth. So this is about that individual's or household's own situation. And then we're going to look at two macro variables and the uh, beliefs that people have about the inflation rate over the next 12 months, and also um, uh, beliefs that they have about the rate of growth of national home prices. So we have two macro beliefs and one micro level. Uh, belief or expectation. How are these um, beliefs elicited by the New York Fed? Well, so I should say that um, the, the, the Fed worked with uh, Chuck Monsky and a lot of other people who have tried to do belief um, elicitation experimentally for a long time. The Fed worked closely with these people. They took about four years to develop the survey. So, so there was a lot of thought put into this. This is not just an instrument they, they came up with overnight. Um, that being said, it's not perfect, and I'm sure that you would all have suggestions as to how the Fed could do this better, but let me tell you what they have as of now. So let's look at the question about um, uh, uh, home prices nationwide, what will happen to prices of, of homes. And again, this is, it's important to know the, world, the, the word nationwide, so this is a macro uh, expectation. Um, people are asked over the next 12 months, what do you expect will happen, will happen to average home prices uh, nationwide? 
uh, will they go up or down? Um, now, also give us, as you see it further down in the page, uh, people have to give us the percent uh, by which prices are going to go up or down. So this is uh, the first moment of beliefs. Um, but then the interesting part is that the next slide of the survey, people are also asked to provide the whole distribution. So you, you see here a bunch of bins for possible values of uh, the rate of growth of national home prices over the next 12 months. The first bin is home prices are going to increase by 12% or more. And then you keep going down to the very last bin, which is the home prices will decrease by 12% or more. So people are asked to put a probability mass on each of these bins. And so this allows the New York Fed um, using a method developed by Engelberg, Mansky and Williams to tell us from these um, um, responses uh, as to you know, how much probability goes into each bin, the Fed can compute again, the first moment of the distribution, as well as the standard deviation of the distribution. And for most people, they can do that. There are certain answers that don't allow the Fed to, do, to be able to compute this, but I'll, I'll skip that because it's uh, somewhat technical. So, so again, this is how we have the whole distributions of, of expectations that people have about their own income growth, home prices nationwide, and inflation nationwide. The question, these probability bins, they, they look exactly the same for all of these three economic quantities. Um, and so for each one of these economic quantities, each, each of these uh, expectations, we have the first moment of the distribution, and we have the second moment, which is what we refer to as uncertainty. So the standard deviation of these distributions is what we in the paper refer to as uncertainty. Um, now, it turns out that the uncertainty that people have when they're coming up with the distribution of their own income growth or inflation or home prices nationwide, those uncertainties, that is how wide these distributions are, these, these things are very correlated within a person. So in, in most of the regressions I'll, sh I'll show you in just a little bit, when I talk about somebody's uncertainty, I'll refer to the average across the three distributions of, of the standard deviations, the widths of these distributions. Again, because there's a very high within person correlation, which is kind of an interesting result in itself. And then I mentioned earlier that we're gonna, um, in the first part of the paper, we're gonna look for the drivers of uncertainty and in, in the cross section. And we have this theory from neuroscience that people who are coming from a more adverse situation are going to have a heightened uncertainty about economic variables. So how do we measure people's uh, economic um, standing or ad adversity? Uh, we have several proxies. We look at their income. We look at their education, uh, whether, for example, they have a college degree or not. We look at their employment uh, levels, um, their degree of financial fragility, as well as, um, if you wish, a, a very objective measure, which is the unemployment rate in the county of residence. You could argue, because this is all survey data, that when people tell you about their employment situation or their income levels, they could lie. You know, they, these are subjective answers. They may not be truthful, but the Fed knows where these people are located. We can, we obtain from the Fed, we are uh, be, be, um, through our co-author, again, Lee, we obtain the location of these respondents. And so we can merge in objective things, for example, like the unemployment rate at the county level, which allow us to come up with a objective measure of the, of the adversity around this individual. Um, and then for the second part of the, of the results, we're gonna look at whether or not all of SQL controlling for people's income and wealth and so forth, if they're more uncertain in their expectations about these economic variables, whether they're going to behave in a more precautionary manner in terms of a few things. In terms of, first of all, their consumption plan for the next 12 months, then in terms of their credit usage, uh, and then finally in terms of their exposure to financial markets. Um, so let's, let's, uh, let's see some results. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are, um, sort of very interesting within person correlations between the extent to which somebody is uncertain about, let's say, their own income growth for growth the next year, and the extent to which they're uncertain about what inflation is going to do, or, or what home prices will do nationwide. And you can see this in this table, for example, the correlation between the standard deviation of somebody's personal income growth distribution, um, and the standard deviation that they have in their inflation um, distribution, that's the, that, that correlation is almost 0.6. And it's the same, again, for each, each pair of these three different standard deviations you're looking at. And I'm not going to make a lot out of it. I'm just going to put it out there. Maybe somebody has a good um, idea to study this later more thoroughly. But the within-person correlation in terms of uncertainty, in terms of the second moment of these distributions, 
is higher than the within person correlation in terms of the first moment. So if you're somebody who's very optimistic about your you know, income growth, so the first moment of your income growth distribution is high, um, you know, that may or may not mean that you're also optimistic about inflation or home price growth. So the correlation in the first moment, which is what you see kind of in the first part of the table here, those correlations are, they are sort of positive, but they're not as large as the correlation in terms of the second moment of the distributions, which is, this, that's something that we didn't expect to see, we don't have a good story for, but it's just an interesting fact. Now, um, the other thing I want to show you about these correlations within person in terms of how uncertain individuals are when they're forming these distributions for economic variables, those correlations turns out they, that they, they decline with income, which is kind of what, what this is actually what we expected from the neuroscience story. So people who are in an adverse situations, situation, those are the people who are going to extrapolate. We're going to think that everything around them is very uncertain, be it inflation or home prices or whatever. So as you see this in this picture here, as the income of the individual growth grows, so they're in a less and less adverse situation based on this one measure, which is income, you observe from this picture that the correlations between their uncertainty in one domain and some other domain, those correlations drop. So there is for, for better off individuals, they, they extrapolate less from one domain to the other. Or if you wish the answers that they have to these different three economic questions, they're, not, they're now more independent from each other if the person is, is better off. Um, so I'm gonna show you this in, uh, in a regression in just a second, but basically if you look at uh, each of these three economic questions that I told you about, personal income growth, inflation nationwide, or home price growth nationwide, you absolutely see that as the income of the person increases, uh, the uncertainty in, in the distribution, how wide the distribution they produce when they're thinking about what this quantity is going to be like in the future, that uncertainty absolutely goes down with income. And whether or not it's you're looking at income growth, own income growth or inflation or, or home prices. Um, and um, there's also a very large effect actually of education here. So controlling for the person's income, individuals who have a college degree, which is what you see on the side of the graph, are going to have lower uncertainty. So education reduces the width of the distributions produced by these people when they're trying to come up or forecast what's gonna to happen to inflation or, or other things. Um, there's also a geographical component of uncertainty um, in that we see that people uh, who are in the, uh, in the Southeast, basically whatever you see as marked as, as uh, orange, that this indicates higher uncertainty. So people in this part of the country uh, tend to have more uncertainty than, than others. Um, the, the individuals who produce tighter distributions are those who live sort of in the middle of the country. These are the blue, the blue states over here. And it turns out, this is, I'm not sure if I have time to tell you more about this, but it turns out that, that um, we can compare the objective distributions of inflation and of home price growth to what people are saying. And the average person in the sample gives us too wide of a distribution for inflation and for national home price appreciation. So when we see a person providing a tight distribution, they're actually closer to the objective truth. Um, so again, what this picture is showing you is that some people in the country are more accurate. They produce less uncertain estimates that so distributions with the, with, that are tighter. And those people tend to be more in the middle of the country. And then there's these, there are people in the Southeast who produce um, less accurate, if you wish, distributions. Um, so let me show you now some regressions. I'm sorry for the small numbers here, but um, I, I'm just going to point out a couple of things. So we're going we're gonna to predict in the cross-section who's more uncertain. And there are, of course, some age effects and gender and race effects. You would not be surprised to see that, that, the, that white individuals are less uncertain. They produce distributions which are tighter. We, females are actually more uncertain. Their distributions are wider. And, and if you recall what, what I just said, Typically, when you provide a, a tighter distribution, you're closer to the objective truth, right? So, so women kind of, if you want to get it, are more likely to get it wrong. They, they come up with two wide distributions. Um, so aside from these sort of very basic um, exogenous demographics, if you now include in these regressions predicting how uncertain people are, how wide their distributions are, if you include in these regressions, um, adversity measures, for example, people's income, their education, uh, whether they're working, uh, whether they indicate that they're financially fragile is measured by this probability of default on some sort of debt in the next three months. 
what you see is that all of these indicators of, of adversity that they're faced with are going to impact uncertainty, just like we predicted from this the neuroscience story. People who have a better situation, less adversity, for example, higher income, are going to have lower uncertainty. They're going to have those tighter distributions that are going to be closer to the objective truth. Um, and then I, I promised earlier to tell you about sort of a, an objective measure of adversity, which is the unemployment in the county of residence. You see that it, it works as you predict. If you live in a county with a more difficult economic situation as proxy by unemployment, then you provide answers that indicate more uncertainty. Your, your distributions about nationwide inflation or home prices or your own income growth are wider. Okay, so uh, what we see here again is just like we, we predicted from the neuroscience story that indeed the, the individuals who have the wider distributions are those who have a a more difficult situation, lower income, uh, their uh, more financial fragility, uh, or those who are not working. Tell me your heads up that you have three more minutes. Okay. So I want to say one more thing about what sort of what drives uncertainty aside from uh, adversity. Numeracy, understanding basic things about probabilities and financial markets matters. So individuals who have high numeracy, um, according to, to um, them being able to do some basic probabilities, for example, related uh, questions for understanding things about diversification, those people are going to be less uncertain. So they're gonna have these tighter and more correct distributions. Um, and then if you look at these interactions between high numeracy and say income or education, you see that if you, if you have high numeracy, you just understand more about probabilities and, and markets in general, then when you predict these distributions, you rely in your predictions less on your own situation. You extrapolate less from your own income or your, or your education level. Um, we also see changes within person in, in, in uncertainty. So if, for example, the working situation changes, if you, uh, if you um, go from being unemployed to being employed, this makes your uncertainty in your distributions drop. So, so we can, this is a um, sort of a, it's reassures us that there's some sort of a causal effect in here. And then the last thing I want uh, to touch on now is are these correlations between uncertainty, controlling for everything, controlling for people's income and wealth and so forth, and behaviors. And what we see is that individuals who all else equal are more uncertain in their distributions about various you know, these three different variables, including two macro ones. Um, these are the people who are going to be less likely to plan to increase spending in the next 12 months. Um, and if you look at the kind of spending that would, this impacts, it turns out um, it's going to be spending on things like, uh, you know, going on trips and buying vehicles, things that seem more discretionary. And in fact, there's there are very clear categories of discretionary versus non-discretionary spending. And people with higher uncertainty levels are particularly likely to say that they will decrease spending on discretionary categories like clothing or recreation. Um, also, in terms of credit usage, we see that people who are more uncertain are those who predict that in the future, credit markets are going to be um, uh, in, in tougher conditions, that is, it will be harder to get credit. And these people who are more uncertain, they seek right now to line up additional credit lines but they do not seek to consume out of those credit lines right now. They're basically just lining up more credit cards just in case down the road they're gonna need it. And finally, uncertainty uh, correlates, again, all else equal, controlling for wealth and income effects and so forth. Uncertainty correlates with people's exposure to financial markets. People who are more uncertain are less likely to invest in equities and they're gonna have a lower fraction of their assets invested in equities. So over, overall, we see a correlation, just like the theory predict between uncertainty the width of these distributions about future economic variables and precautionary behaviors. Now you might say that in, the, in our data, what we call uncertainty, this, this, the width of these distributions, perhaps is just risk preferences, perhaps risk averse people just tend to put down their wider distributions. And it turns out that there are measures in the New York survey um, uh, of consumer expectations that are about risk tolerance in particular. And if you control for these people's risk tolerance, we, we do not, see the effects that we showed earlier, these correlations between uncertainty and, and behaviors go away in any way. So the, the width of these distributions that people produce and, and risk tolerance, these are not the same quantities. These are orthogonal things in the data. And then I'm gonna end with this, which is we were able to, to get, again, to get some data uh, in months post COVID. And, and there's a very interesting pattern here. So 
uh, you, you all know about the Baker Blumen Davis uncertainty index. Um, and you see here that that index, just like we all know, jumped after February 2020, it jumped up. This is the blue line in the picture. But I'm also plotting here the uncertainty across the respondents in the survey from the Fed that is, a, you know, based on these households' beliefs about the two macro variables I mentioned, inflation and home prices nationwide. So I, I'm, I'm averaging the uncertainty across these two macro variables across all the respondents in any given month in the survey, about 1,200 such people per month. And what I want you to see here is two things. Number one, when COVID hit, just like, a, like the Baker, Bloom, and Davis measure of uncertainty shot right up, okay, the blue line went, went up, the red line went up too, household uncertainty about inflation and home prices jumped right away. And then just like the Baker, Bloom, and Davis measure dropped in the subsequent months after February 2020, the household's uncertainty also dropped. So that's fact number one. After this very large shock, households' uncertainty, these subjective beliefs that people have, how uncertain they are in these beliefs, it jumped just like the macro policy uncertainty that you get from, you know, in the Baker and Bloom and Davis methodology based looking at what's, say, discussed in the press. But the second fact I want to see, I'm going to show you here, is that in these years, 2013 to 2020, before COVID hit, which are years of good economic conditions, there's no big shock, really. I mean, there's no recession in here between 2013 and 2020. In these good times, if you wish, the policy uncertainty, the Baker, Bloom, and Davis index, and this household's measures of measure of uncertainty about macro variables, these two things have a correlation of exactly zero. So I, I want to leave you all with this fact because it's it understanding what makes households uncertain is very important for a policymaker. And what this picture tells us is that there's a whole lot of course of cross-sectional variation across households, like I was just telling you about. But, but it takes a huge macro shock to sort of move everybody up in sync, all of these households. And that's what we saw in 2020 in February. But in normal times, macro policy uncertainty and households uncertainty, they, are, they do not seem to be one and the same thing. Thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to your comments. Thanks, Kami. So, uh, so we see hands. How about this? We let's experiment this following format. We take let's say three questions all together. Please state your comments and questions briefly and succinctly, and then Tammy can address them all together after that. So Steve, um, Nick, and Simon, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, thanks, Paul. Th thanks for an interesting talk. Uh, I wanted to focus on age in the interpretation of your results and the specification. So, you know, we know from lots of work, Deaton and Paxson, among many others, that there are pronounced um, relationships between age and both the first and second moments of the distribution of income and consumption outcomes and so on. You have quadratic controls for age in your specifications. I suspect that's not really adequate. Um, I would encourage, you have, you have enough data, I would encourage you to include one year age uh, bins or maybe two or three year age bins um, and sweep out age for everything. Even the initial set of descriptive results that you showed us, it's hard to know whether the people in the Southeast, for example, are just, uh, and, the, and the West Coast are just younger than people in the Northeast and the Midwest. And that's why you're finding these results. So I, I would condition out uh, age in a very non-parametric way. In doing that, you will also be sweeping out cohort effects. So right now you've got, it's really hard to disentangle what you're showing us from what may be cohort and age effects. They're separately interesting, but I think the way you talk about things, you're mostly appealing to theories that are um, conditional on certainly age effects, life cycle effects, maybe cohort effects as well. Thanks. I think we're taking two more questions and I reply, right? Was that, was that the rule? Yeah, Simon and then Nick. Okay, uh, I'd like to see more discussion about can, how do you distinguish between the forecast of personal income and national inflation? If you ask me as a regular consumer, I know 100%, right? For my personal income next year or, or with like really high probability, I know. But if you ask, ask me for inflation, uh, I would say I'm not sure. Uh, and also related to that, since you mentioned that this uh, one particular household entered the survey at 12 months in a row, 
if you ask the mean inflation repeatedly, are you going to learn? So if that is, that's the case, which measure you would use? You use the original reply or use the one really close to the survey to the end of the end of the survey? I'm done, Nick. Hi, hey, Camille, that was great. Super interesting. I, I've heard about this New York Fed survey. It's great to see, uh, see it in practice. I had a couple of, I guess I have a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll stick to it. Time. If this was in person, I'd grab you in the coffee break, I think. Thanks. But, uh, so one question is, how many people can answer these questions? So Steve, Steve and I have been asking lots of questions like this with various other co-authors about firms over the years, actually tons of them. And it's quite hard because we're there, we're asking like CFOs, people that typically have like MBAs or I don't know, you know, accountants, very numerous. I just wondered what share of people give up and can't answer it or give numbers that look totally implausible. So like probabilities that don't add to 100 percent or put all the mass in one bin or, you know, you can you, you when you look at these things, you can see some stuff that looks pretty weird. And I wondered what share do and whether you use it, because you could claim, I don't know, whether you think they're truly 90 in uncertainty. When we did this in the UK, there are about 10 percent of people that were firms that said I can't answer because Brexit's made it impossible to forecast anything. So we normally threw them away as missing. But in that case, we're like, well, maybe that's 90 in uncertainty. So thanks. Very good. Yeah. So can I, I, can I can, sorry, go ahead, please. I, I was gonna explain my role and throw in one more question. I didn't get to okay. raise my hand. If I, if we think about the transmission, economic transmission of macro uncertainty, it seems like one implication one might potentially draw from this analysis is that that transmission is gonna be largely largely via these better educated and uh, higher income. Um, households just because they are more cognizant about the movements in the uh, changes um, in the macro uncertainty. I, I, I wonder if that would be something uh, you have in mind. And, and relatedly, I wonder for folks working in cyclically sensitive industries, would that facilitate part of the learning in terms of mitigating this um, um, uh, a bias, so to speak, uh, hardwired from the upbringing experience? Um, Kami, please. Thank you so much. Excellent question. So, uh, Stephen, we uh, we have absolutely used age dummies in uh, our analyses. I think just so that I just for the to keep things simple in the regressions right now, I just threw in the the quadratic effects. But if you plot uncertainty as a function of of age dummies or bins, you know, or dummies for age bins, for example, you see a very clear pattern where uncertainty is high for people in their twenties. And then it drops and it's the lowest for people in their late 40s. And then it goes back up again in their, for people in their 50s, 60s and so forth. So there is a, a sweet spot and that people in their 40s to 50s are the ones who produce the tightest distributions. Now, it could be, uh, so this was just a, a very clear uni, uh, um, univariate result that we saw in a picture. I didn't put it in the paper because I'm, we're not trying to talk about age effects and uncertainty, um, but uh, one driver of that, you know, why is it that people in their 40s and 50s are the ones who have the lowest amount of uncertainty? It could be that these, these are the individuals actually who are most likely to be employed. And we see a very clear effect of if you're employed in the data, you provide these tight distributions. And as I said earlier, tighter, at least for inflation and home prices, tighter means better. You're closer to objectively what distributions you could get if you used to, if you looked at um, at uh, historical data. So uh, I agree the age effects are there. We are just trying to simplify the exposition in these regressions by putting the, uh, the um, effects as quadratic, but we have definitely put in dummies too. And um, they soak up a lot of variation, like you said. Now, um, Simon, you said, hey, Cami, when you asked me about my own income growth, I'm pretty sure about that, right? I've, I basically, I work for a university, like I'm a UNC, I work for a university. I know that my income growth is gonna be one of two numbers, zero or 3% per year. Um, rarely it's something different. Um, and so, whereas if you have to think about inflation nationwide, you know, you'd say, well, a lot of things could be possible. I just, I don't know, let me give you a wider distribution. That's what we were thinking we're gonna find in data too. But it turns out that if somebody is uncertain about one of these three quantities, inflation, home prices, or income growth, they tend to be uncertain about everything else, about the other two variables. So there is this, um, you know, Simon, maybe you and I are different. Maybe you and I are not sort of like the average respondent here, but in the sample, 
there is this extrapolation from one domain, from one economic question to the other two economic questions. And I think that's very interesting. Now, um, you, the, the final thing you asked, Simon, is the respondents are in the data for up to 12 months in a row when we're looking at their beliefs and, for example, how they relate to future choices. Uh, if, you, if you look at their uncertainty, when do we measure that uncertainty? And uh, right now, the uncertainty is measured as of the, the month before we observe their choices. These, the information about choices, about behavior, for example, your consumption plan, investment, credit market usage, this information is not uh, obtained from survey participants every month. These, the modules about behaviors are only given infrequently. So to predict the behavior, we use the inflation uncertainty or whatever, uh, measured as of the last month before we observe the behavior. But we can, of course, we can take the average across the responses of the individual over time. Um, and you get the same sort of response because there's persistence. That being said, people do get uh, better over time. You're, you, had, you had a conjecture about that. So um, the general pattern is that people become, um, up until COVID hit, people, the res respondents become more and more certain in the 12, as the 12 months in the survey progress, they, they become a little bit tighter in the distributions. All right, um, maybe because they read more news about that, those topics like inflation or home prices, for instance. Now, um, Nick, you said, uh, Cami, people cannot answer these questions. A lot of people are confused about them or they do not know how to add probabilities, right? So what's in those bins adds up to 100%. I, I agree with you. And we have several ways to identify people who, let's just say they don't pay attention, okay? so. Uh, we have a measure of their numeracy, their comfort with probabilities. So, and that's that measure we use some, in some of the analyses, but we're trying to also see if there are people who are just, they don't care, they don't pay attention. Um, you know, it could be that in part because they have absolutely no clue. They don't even know what inflation means. So how do I identify these people? And, and we have a couple of ways, but one of them I think you'll appreciate. So. There were these, I showed you guys two screens that were used by the Fed to get information about expectations. The first screen said, hey, Nick Bloom, participant, what do you think will be the rate of inflation in the next 12 months? Give us a number. So Nick Bloom says, hmm, 3%. So, so you give us a point estimate on that first page. But then the second page of the survey comes and you see the bins, right? So you're gonna to have to put a probability mass on each of those bins starting from inflation is going to be more than 12% to all the way inflation is going to be less than minus 12%. So now if I see that you only put a probability mass on bins that say that inflation is going to be, let's say 5% or higher, that tells me that your point estimates from the previous page is not in the support of a distribution that you're providing me on the second page. So you're not internally consistent. And so this is our, our very first test to see whether people are paying attention. Does the answer that they provide, the point estimate they provide on the first page of the survey, does that lie somewhere in the support of the distribution that they produce on the second page? Because if it doesn't, then people are just not, you know, they're not trying hard enough. And we eliminate a bunch of people based on that. And I should say that's that's about, I would say, 10% of the people in the sample. Um, there are some other ways to, um, to identify liars, like, you know, where people who, something along the lines of one to 2% come up with numbers in those bins that do not add up to 100%. So it, most people know that these things have to add up to 100%. And it's in part because in the survey, it says at the bottom of the screen, make sure the numbers add up to 100%. So, the Fed is trying to help these people. So, so uh, what, um, as of now in the analysis, we are not using these people who we call unattentive, they're dropped out of the sample, but I think it's a good idea to go back and look at these people's data because maybe it's not about inattention. Maybe these people are just completely unfamiliar with the concept. And you know what, in the population, if you've got 10, 20, you know, 20% 20 of people in the population being completely unfamiliar with the topic, you wanna understand what they're doing you know, because they do matter. It's, it's a large mass. So maybe we can use those data in the future. And then let me, let me um, uh, go to the last question, which is when policymakers want to change expectations about something, if they want to put some tight bounds in people's heads about what it is going to be in the future, 
who will be reached by the messages sent by these policymakers. Um, based on these data, I cannot tell you that, right? All I can say is somehow people who have higher income, better education, these are the people who come up with distributions that are closer to the objective truth, at least in terms of inflation and home prices. We cannot check how good the distributions are when, they're, when we're thinking about these people's own income growth because we don't observe their income for a long time, right? But in terms of these macro variables, we know that higher in income individuals, higher education people, those living in countries with less unemployment come up with these better distributions. How they got there, it's a great question, right? Will these people who have the better distributions, will they also respond in a more accurate way to policy messages Again, this is a great question. And there is a little bit of effort in that, in that direction that's done by a group uh, uh, that includes Olivier Armentier from the New York Fed, as well as a bunch of people from the European Central Bank. They have uh, done a survey where they try to provide information to some of the respondents to see whether or not people adjust their expectations, including the second moment, based on what the, you know, the survey, uh, the European Central Bank is telling these people. And so there is some uh, adjustment there, um, and but it's not the data that I saw doesn't really clearly say who adjusts, you know, better based on income or education. The um, uh, thank you, Kevin. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I know this I, is I, really I, reaching I, the end of it. Yeah. You want to, okay. So sorry, I, I'm gonna apologize to Steve and Tarek. I saw that they both raised your. Raise your hands if you don't mind. Please type your questions or comments in the chat window. And with that, thank you, Cami, very much for the very thought-provoking paper. Let's um, move on to Michael. He's going to tell us about uh, monitor policymakers and certainty. Thank you. So Over much. to you, Michael. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, um, monetary policy makers uncertainty. This is joint with Anna, who is temporarily in the crowd, but has to leave very shortly. Uh, Stephen Hansen and uh, Song Zhao, who is at uh, uh, LSE, PhD student at LSE. Um, given the great conference, um, which actually had the extra bonus yesterday of having a paper on uh, that talked about inventories, which I love. Um, it, I don't have to explain this this part of the slide you know that there's an interest in the effects of uncertainty more generally in in, in the macro economy and uh, and policy uncertainty in particular and uh, Bo and John um, as well as Steve and, uh, and and Nick have been involved in papers which have, have you know come up with measures of um, uncertainty about monetary policy uh, and so this is actually from from Bo's paper um, you know but I think I hope I'm in, not going to be attacked for interpreting it this way. I would say this is a, a public perception uncertainty index of, about monetary policy. So what this paper is about is basically trying to dig into where that comes from, but by really going to find out how uncertain are the policymakers themselves. Um, now, this I think this is interesting because um, you know, it, it could be that all, all the movement in the in, in the indices that we have already are exactly driven by the policymakers and their communications. But equally, you know, I think there's a there's a difficult part of this, which is if you think about a, a very generic reaction function, um, policymakers react to the state of the economy, um, and and therefore some of what they are doing with interest rates, or some of what the public, when thinking about what interest rates might do will reflect the fact that the economy is uncertain and therefore you know we can't tell exactly what the fed will do because you know we don't know what world the fed will find itself in there's also an interesting question it's a very old question in macro about uh, about how policymakers should behave under uncertainty so you know separate to the uncertainty of the world you know they might not know the transmission of their policy they may not know you know the slope of the phillips curve and therefore, that may change how they optimally react, and that would itself generate uncertainty about um, policy. Or you could even, for, for the public measures, you might think that there are sort of strong disagreeing narratives uh, on the FOMC, and you don't know which one will win out. And so, so digging into it is interesting for that reason. And I think it's also interesting 
because, you know, there's a large literature that shows, you know, the importance of risk and uncertainty in asset prices and a growing literature that talks about the role of information communication by central banks. So that's sort of where we find ourselves. So, so I know some people in the audience have seen me present this at various times. Um, I, I'm going to focus on hopefully some different parts of the paper today. But um, the first thing I think we do in this paper, and I hope I'll show you, is we're going to um, come up with a, a measure, a series of measures of uncertainty um, that derives from policymakers themselves. So um, just to add to the three letter acronyms, uh, we're going to have PMU to fight with uh, EPU and others. Um, so um, that's one contribution. Um, the, the second is really to, to show the different sources of that uncertainty. So to give you some stylized facts. And, and, and one thing that really is striking, I think, is that, that you know, the aggregate, which I, I'll show you in a few minutes, um, is really driven by movements in lots of subcomponents of things that I, I, at least I think are, are, are sensible sort of ways of cutting up the, the, the uncertainty. And um, the other thing I'm gonna try and show you is that, that the sort of policymakers themselves the, the existing measures are not exactly perfect, um, perfectly capturing what they're uncertain about. So there's quite a lot of uncertainty that policymakers have that doesn't leak out uh, into, into the existing measures. And the final part, sort of going back to this literature about how policymakers react in the face of uncertainty, I'm going to present some evidence of a sort of Brainard style gradualism, particularly related to inflation uncertainty. Uh, and then I'll, I'll, I'll show you a, a little bit on the communication at the very end, but that's very much work in progress. OK, so just to just to sort of fix ideas, I want to I want to sort of think about a very simple model. This is not there's nothing structural in this paper where we're going to sort of estimate this model, although uh, for one bit, I will just um, sort of use it as a, as a lens to interpret things. But some of the some of the sort of challenges in in um, in this in this world, you can kind of see. And this is a problem which I don't think we're going to I'm going to be up front. We're not going to be able to fix this immediately. We're going to eventually come up with some kind of measure, let's say, of how uncertain policymakers are about inflation. But you can see if this was the, the sort of Svensson style model was the underlying model driving it. There are lots of things which could give rise to that uncertainty. And so since we're not going to be able to directly measure, you know, whether they're uncertain about particular slopes, although we have tried, um, we're going we're gonna to be in a world where we're going to have to sort of uh, interpolate from the effects of that uncertainty on their behavior about what might be driving it. So that's, that's sort of where I'm going to go with this. Um, uh, let me jump on. So the, 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 idea, the idea that we're going to have is we're going to measure you know, overall and individual uncertainty, and then see what effects it has on, on their policy behavior. Um, you know, broadly speak, speaking, I can split the types of uncertainty you might think they face into three. They're three very broad uh, areas. So one is you might think it's just, you know, the volatility of the shocks that, uh, that hit the economy. Um, now, in this simple Svensson type model, actually, uh, your optimal reaction to, to things in the economy is independent of the variance of the shocks. That's very specifically part of a class of models and not a general fact. But you might think that, you know, if shocks are hitting the economy, then I will just be less able to predict what GDP or inflation will do. And therefore, they should turn up directly there, but may or may not have any impact on, on my reaction, except to the shocks themselves. If I think of uncertainty as itself being a source of demand shock, then I'm in a world where, like other demand shocks, the central bank may wish to respond to that. And therefore, they are responding to the impact, let's say, of um, consumer uncertainty about the world on, on what they think will happen to the economy. And they're sort of preemptively reacting in the usual way. Interesting set of papers there. And then the final one, the one, the bro final broad one is where policymakers themselves are uncertain about the parameters or the model world they live in. And there in, in that class of models, you typically get that their optimal reaction depends on the variance of, say, the parameters. So how uncertain they are about the slope of the Phillips curve will affect how much they react aggressively to shocks or not. Um, the classic Brainard uh, result is in the face of parameter uncertainty, you become more gradualist. Uh, Ulf Söderström has a sort of paper from about 20 years ago where he shows that that finding is actually a little bit specific 
within a certain class of models specific to which parameters you're uncertain about. So, so I'll show a little bit um, about that later. Okay, let me just get straight into the data. But again, I'm gonna stand on the shoulders of giants because what we do is, is, is really quite similar to, to both what we saw yesterday in, in, um, in Tarek's paper, um, but also in Steve's paper. You know, we, we're gonna we're gonna take the transcripts is what I'm gonna focus on. I'll speak a little bit also about the minutes. We're gonna take those and we're gonna essentially classify individual sentences as referring to uncertainty when there is a uh, an uncertainty trigger word. Okay, and we will do that for the transcripts, focusing on certain sections of the transcripts, and they, that that becomes quite important. And I'll talk about that. Uh, on the next slide. But just as sort of context um, of all of the sentences in the main sort of economic policy discussion parts of the transcripts, um, uncertainty occurs in, in, in around 7% of, of the sentences. So, you know, uh, it's certainly the case that uncertainty is sort of ubiquitous in, in the discussion of monetary policy. Um, obviously, it's a very small percentage of the total number of words or tokens, um, but but it, within sentences, there's, there's lots of sentences that have these uncertainty triggers. Um, okay, so yeah, um, we have a list of words like, um, I am worried about, I'm uncertain, I don't know. And these are all sort of in the dictionary, which um, the dictionary here, which triggers the fact that that sentence by that speaker at that moment gives rise to uh, an uncertainty word. And at some very basic level, an aggregate index is simply the total number of all uncertainty words or sentences divided by the total number of sentences or words, depending on what you want to do. Um, some of the words are listed here. We do take care of negation, but only in so far as if you say I am, we're measuring uncertainty. We're not, we're not, we're not measuring a sort of certainty scale. So if you say I'm not uncertain, that that trigger no longer adds to the index. It doesn't take away from any earlier, uh, earlier um, statements of uncertainty in the meeting. Obviously, one of the advantages of this, which I will talk only very briefly about today, is that we can do this for individual members. So we actually get a distribution of uncertainty within every meeting which is also a kind of neat thing that we can work with. But um, I'm going to do a lot of things at the aggregate level today. These are the aggregate levels I've, I've put together here in red, the transcripts, and in blue, the minutes. Um, again, let me. it might be a little easier just to see the spikes. You can, you can take a sort of a, a moving average just to see the spikes. We don't use moving averages in the regressions, but just to, to see them. Um, and you can see there are, there are sort of two main spikes in the, in the sample. Um, that starts with Greenspan in 1987. There's just before the financial crisis um, and, and a sort of really elevated level of uncertainty around there. And there was also one in 2003, which was around the time of the Iraqi invasion, which actually the March 2003 uh, statement is one of the only statements where the Fed actually came out and said, it is so uncertain, we genuinely don't know what to do yet, we're just going to wait. Um, so, so that's the sort of aggregates. Um, one thing I do want to stress is, and, and I, I know there's many people here from the Fed, so um, that they will know this, I'm sure, better than I do. But the general structure of the FOMC, which is is there at least since um, at least since Greenspan and until the last transcripts I've seen in, in 2015, there are three main parts, three regular parts of the, the meeting where they discuss or they lead, they do the discussion of information that leads into the policy. So the first one is the markets part where there is an update on the market conditions. This has evolved a little bit over time, so we should be careful of that. Then there is a similar part which discusses economic conditions or now economic and credit conditions. And then there's a part which is where they actually discuss, given the state of the economy, what is the appropriate policy response? Now, it, it's not perfect, but in, in most of the time, they will aim to you know, keep discussion of policy to the, th this part. So uh, most of this would be discussing, say, the state of the economy, the state of the markets, and then conditional on that, they make their, 
their decisions on policy. So we've stripped out all the other parts. There's loads of really interesting parts of FOMC meetings. At least I think they're really interesting. Special topic discussions. They have elections for particular posts that have to be filled. There's a lot of pleasantries. There's some you know, legal stuff that has to go on, but we're really going to focus on just the economics. So we, we, we've been using that um, before. We continue to use it. We will at times split out the uncertainty that's being driven by the staff. There are some really interesting dynamics of where the staff introduce it versus the, the members themselves. Um, because the, even within these sections, you can see there's sort of components where typically these sections begin with the Fed staff presenting some information and then the, uh, the FOMC members taking over at that point. And, and we're gonna use, use that structure. Um, okay, oops. Let me move on. Okay, just as, as, a, um, as some facts, uh, in terms of all of the uncertainty that occurs that we, we identify, uh, most of it occurs in their discussion of the economy um, and you know, uh, some in the policy and some in the, in the markets. Within those sections, you know, the, the percentages are pretty similar across, across the three sections. So really what that's reflecting is most of the meeting is discussing the economic situation much more than they're discussing markets, particularly early on where the market sections were not very long. And again, not controlling for the amount they speak, although of course we can do that, the, the vast majority of the uncertainty is introduced by members. So, so it's about 72% of it. I said there was a lot of heterogeneity among um, particular members. So this is just a, a, a cross section of, of particular members. So at one end, you have someone like Janet Yellen, who in her time there um, spoke much more about uncertainty than, say, Alan Greenspan. Again, some of this is time fixed effect. If you're on the committee during a particularly calm and nice period, then you're not going to have as much reason to. So this is just these are just descriptive statistics. We also split out some separate components. So we, again, have, uh, along with uncertainty, if they occur in the same sentence with particular other trigger words, we label them as inflation, wage, and cost uncertainty, or economic and growth uncertainty, markets, policy. We have these words about models, so you know, coefficients, estimations, parameters, et cetera. Um, and then there's an, an other category, which is essentially a residual category. Um, there are some things in that residual category which we can easily classify and we have not yet. So, for example, some big political events and wars occur in there. Um, you know, I, I guess at some level we could strip them out and, and put them in with the others. But most economic models do not have uh, monetary models do not have a separate role for that type of uncertainty. So we're just going to call it other and treat it as a residual for now. We, we may revisit that as we revise the paper. Here just... Um, I won't spend long on these, but this is sort of just to show you that, you know, in the sentences that are triggered as model or policy, depending on which part you look at, you know, if, if you look at the model, the, the words, the most common words in those are things like trend, Nairu, model, parameter, relationship, measurement. So we're sort of happy that we're picking up the right things. And we're also happy that the other doesn't show any clear patterns, but we are really just picking up a kind of smorgasbord of times when members say uncertainty about something, but there's nothing sort of that systematic in there. Okay, so again, we can look at these. Um, the red are the uh, smooth versions, but the underlying series are plotted as well. Um, you can see, and I should point this out, we should, I should have fixed this. Uh, the, the, the axes are not exactly the same on each of them. So, by far, the sort of the, the biggest numbers you would see occur with relate, in relation to economic and markets uncertainty. Uh, interestingly, that spike that occurred in the run up to the financial crisis was much more related to inflation. And for those who were around at the time will remember this was the time when the US economy was going fantastically well, but inflation was staying low. And there are lots of questions about how long imported inflation from China could keep inflation down and whether it would pick up. Um, there was a lot of questions at the time, as there are now, about the slope of the Phillips curve. Um, Michael, sorry, can you say again how you distinguish these topics? Sorry, I missed that. Yeah, so it's it's if a, if a sentence is triggered as uncertainty, and then it contains a, a, a separate set of, of words related to inflation. So, for example, if, if it contains the word inflation or costs or prices in that sentence about inflation, it will be tagged as an inflation wage uh, uncertainty um, 
measure, and then we calculate the indices in the same way. Okay, and you've picked those words, right? Yeah, that's right. No, no, we, we, we have picked them. That's correct, yeah. Uh, I mean, and, and, but again, if you go back, this, this sort of chart, if I focus in on this, this chart tells you that in those sentences, now inflation was clearly one of the words we used, but these are the, this is the, the sort of the, the, the word cloud of all the words that appear in the ones we classify. I, I think it picks up a lot of things that we would think of as being related to inflation wages. But that, that's, this is, as I was mentioning to you, this, this is not like highfalutin machine learning picking this. This is us with a dictionary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, very little discussion of model uncertainty in those sections. So again, it, it, it peaks occasionally, but but it, it, the, the sort of the scale on the models stuff is, is just much lower. And policy is actually particularly problematic. So policy is words related to the Fed funds rate. Um, but yeah, it's a difficult one because actually, as you'll see here, if I show you this, so other is obviously a residual, but we, we, we more than 100% explain our sentences by, by these categories, because it's possible that you can talk about inflation and policy uncertainty in the same sentence. So you can kind of double count that a sentence can be dual classified. Um, so we do quite well at explaining this stuff, but there is this other category which, which sort of gets us home and dry sometimes. And one of the difficulties with the policy one is that often when they talk about their policy reaction, it might be some type of uncertainty that's driving that. And so far, we haven't really come up with a, a, a particularly good way of, of separating those out, but we are working on it. Five minute marker, Michael. Sorry, yeah. Five minutes? Yeah. Oh, gosh, excellent. Right, let me skip this one. Let me say a few things. Okay, so if we get this, if we, if we just run simple regressions of this on the, the equivalent timed uh, uh, measures by um, the, the EPU or the MPU measures, um, you can see that the, the sort of thing that's common between them, between most of them, is the economic policy. Uh, interestingly, the uh, at least for the, the Baker, Bloom and Davis one, but also if we look at the VIX, th there seems to be a negative correlation with the inflation uncertainty. And I think there's two, there's two interpretations of that. One is these are the perfect policymakers that when everything is nice and calm, they worry a lot about inflation and where it might be coming from. The other is that actually when inflation is particularly uncertain, they have a well-known hawkish reaction function, which means people aren't uncertain about what they'll do, but they just know that they're going to start raising rates. And, and, and there's nothing in this equation that will let us cut through that. Um, we can also measure um, uh, individual level stance through, through whether or not they talk about the Fed funds rate and increasing it or tightening it. So again, uh, based off a dictionary measure. So the blue is dovish, uh, red is hawkish. You can see these things sort of move um, um, it, 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 as mirrors of each other. So when they're talking about tightening, they're not talking so much about loosening, although in theory, different members could. Um, almost all of their policy discussion occurs in that section that we call the policy section. So we're sort of happy with that this section, dissection. Um, but this is just to show you that these measures of Hawk and Dove do correlate in the way you would expect with changes in the Fed funds rate or with the Roma Roma shocks. These are all aggregate meeting level variables. So when they talk more hawkishly, they are more likely to generate a Roma Roma shock or to increase the Fed funds rate controlling for a bunch of green book forecasts and lags. So we think they're reasonably good measures of policy stance. OK, what about the effects of uncertainty? Well. The big effect of uncertainty is in the language they use talking about the, the stance. So the more economic uncertainty they have, the less likely they are to talk about hawkishness. The more inflation uncertainty they have, the more likely they are to talk about hawkishness. And this includes after controlling for these green book forecasts. So, I mean, one way to interpret this is that they do have a directional reaction, at least in terms of language, and we know that that language has a correlation then with actual decisions uh, to these different types of uncertainty. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna have to skip over the, the, the next modeling part, um, really just to show that, actually, I'll, I'll have to show it here. If you, if you allow a world where you're uncertain about the coefficients of your model, so let me, let me focus on, um, say this, if this 
and this these two these two parameters in the in the inflation relationship of of this simple Svensson type model if they are random variables and so you are uncertain about those you can generate and this is the Soderstrom paper you can generate the the gradualism type result if you have uncertainty about the pass through the more uncertain you are about the pass through of the output gap into inflation the more gradualist you would be in this model and if you're more uncertain about the about the um the ar1 coefficient in the relationship you become more activist okay so so again until we have a good way to uh, directly measure these um these individual parts or estimate them or structurally estimate them i'm just going to say that you know if we then look at whether or not these measures are likely or not to ca cause your language to be gradualist so there's a whole bunch of terms you know wait and see move more slowly etc you can see a very strong relationship with inflation and that type of language there is a slightly oppositely signed effect with the economic uncertainty which is completely killed off once you include the green book controls so the way i interpret this is the economic shocks the economic uncertainty that they seem to be reacting seems to look much more like the kind of demand shock you know the world is uncertain therefore people are going to save more therefore the economy will slow therefore you know we should we can we can stimulate the economy we can do something with the federal funds rate on the inflation side they seem to sort of be more hawkish raise rates and equally at the same time talk about doing so though in a slow steady wait and see kind of way okay let me uh there's a bunch of stuff that i i, I should have talked about but i didn't manage my time particularly well let me uh let me say two other uh things i'll skip that one so at the individual level just to say that all of these basic results go through at the at the individual level but are completely killed off if you either include time fixed effects as i do in this table or if you just include the aggregate meeting level um versions of the uncertainty so the way i interpret this is that there is a lot of this variation that happens but it's all coming through the time series on the committee but what we are able to at least do with the individual level regressions is include person fixed effects so it's not just driven by the fact that we had a bunch of sort of very hawkish people who happened to serve at a time when there was a lot of uncertainty it's actually controlling for all of that you still get this general effect going through but it's not at the individual you know if i'm more if i'm more um on slightly more uncertain than Tarek that you get this big significant effect it seems to be more driven identified off the time effect okay let me just uh sorry bo i'm going to take 30 more seconds just to say um where 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 we're going now at the moment with this um although i have been saying this for a while so so i think the really interesting thing is you know this open question of how much should you communicate your uncertainty and i'm just going to leave you with a picture and this is a picture that's similar to what you saw before but the black line is the um the 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 measures aggregate measures from the minutes obviously we can't do individual level at the minutes and the aggregates of the transcripts and you can see that that you know while there is correlation between them there are a number of things that are never communicated so our residual our, our kind of catch-all residual which is quite important in the transcripts never makes it into the minutes um, and is very and is quite correlated with roma roma shocks so whatever these these are idiosyncratic references to uncertainty that just don't you know those those there's just not a residual we pick up everything in the minutes this is a, a testament to the excellent drafting of the fomc secretariat and um, model uncertainty some of it creeps through but again the sort of amount of time dedicated in both is small but proportionally even smaller in the minutes so they talk a lot less about the sort of technical stuff they're uncertain about they often communicate their uncertainty about markets although um, there are some interesting variations that you you may you may um wonder about so uh, the the fact that they they seem to in the minutes be communicating a declining level uncertainty about markets just before the financial crisis is a, is a sort of interesting one oops sorry um 
And then, you know, again, there are periods where they talk much more openly about uncertainty, relatively speaking, about the economy, you know, the sort of exogenous to them uncertainty and less in the in the minutes. OK, I will stop there. Sorry, Bo, I overshot again. Let me stop my show. So I saw Tarek has the hand up and also I saw Matteo typed in a long comment in case Matteo wants to expand to, to expand on expand on your comment and some colors. Why don't we do this? Um, Tarek, Steve, Nick, Nancy, and then Matteo, in case you want to add more color to your comments, but um, folks, please uh, state your questions and comments briefly. Let's go. Okay, so very, uh, very briefly. So I, I think this is awesome. I, uh, I just wanted to uh, like, so I think it's kind of interesting that over time we seem to be converging on like a, an agreed upon level of compl like complexity in, in method. So I, I kind of really like that. Um, so one thing I wanted to highlight, we've had like a similar, like, uh, so we have this COVID paper floating around that kind of lo looks at discussions of COVID and earnings calls and has kind of a similar set of problems. Like in, for example, with the other category that you have floating around there. And we've sort of landed on like, uh, a, you know, sort of a surveillance approach to that, to sort of like read cross sections once in a while and see if your topics still fit. I'm not sure if that's of interest, but like maybe maybe have a look um, uh, in the paper. So we had kind of, I think, similar de debates to what you had. Bye. Okay, okay. Bye. Re really cool stuff. Um, quick. quick Quick question. Can you just remind us the time lag between uh, meeting decisions and when the minutes are released and then when the transcripts are released? Um, my more substantive question is, uh, can you say anything about the extent to which this information leaks out in other ways through like speeches by uh, board members and bank presidents? Thanks. Nick? I, I, I can't compete with Steve's cute baby in the background. He <laughs> um, was really fantastic. Um, I, I think the inflation point is super interesting. The fact that basically inflation uncertainty is negatively correlated. It's a kind of an issue. It highlights an issue. I think bedevils all of us that are doing this tech stuff. So, you know, Tarek and Stephen, Stephen, and, which is there's a, there's a fixed amount of text. They're not talking about one uncertainty. They may move to another. You know, I see it in the UK which is the discussion of Brexit uncertainty collapsed as soon as COVID came along because the newspapers moved to talk about something else. And it's the same in some... So I don't know how you deal with it. It would be great if you have any thoughts. I mean, it's a very broad point that in a fixed volume of text, if something talks a lot about other things get contracted. Thanks. That was a fantastic paper. And I, I just, okay, I'll stop. Okay, we would you like to expand on your comment? Yeah. I think it's pretty well, I think explanatory. everybody can read it. The, the bottom line is that, you know, th there may be situations in which I believe that uh, the nature of the FNC process and the length of it can actually, can actually lead to overestimate uncertainty over time. Not, and even if the underlying uncertainty of policymakers has not changed, there could be situations in which, uh, because everything else is certain, say the, for the assessment of the first moment, then you end up talking about uncertainty because you know everything about real-time conditions, shipments, uh, assessment of real-time data. So if there's a way in which uh, you can control for that, I mean, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's, it's an open question, but uh, definitely it's uh, obviously a very interesting uh, topic, as you can imagine. Michael, would you like to respond briefly? We might have to save some of the discussions offline bilaterally, but um, please take it away. Okay, I thought there was one other hand up, but okay, fine. Um, they can get in touch with me. Yeah, thanks for thanks for those comments. Yeah, let me work backwards, um, um, partly to make sure that I dedicate uh, a large amount of time to Matteo for his uh, the amount of time he spent typing his. Um, the, uh, I, I think that's right. So we, we, we do try a little bit. So, so there's a lot of things that you can do. You know, you can try and control for the amount the staff have discussed uncertainty. Now, again, you might say they're as subject to it as everybody else. Um, but you know, you can you can take their their pre-prepared text. You can take the green book, uh, the green books and the blue books, as I think of them. But now they're teal books, um, and you can try and control for it that way. We've tried to. Um, 
I think this relates a little bit to Nick's point as well. I mean, one way I think about this is as as and, and something I've been working on with some some other colleagues is to think about policymakers as themselves rational inattention agents. OK, so 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 they have an amount of time or amount of mental energy that they have to allocate across everything. Now, a, a, a standard rational inattention model tells you, and this is the sort of answer to your question, Nick, that they would likely allocate their attention to the most uncertain areas that have the largest impact on their decision. Now, OK, so that's tricky. And I think that's the thing that makes it interesting, because it's not just it's not just that they give attention to the thing that's most uncertain. If there's something that's only a little bit uncertain, but has a really big impact, they should also give it a lot of attention. So I think both the comments that, that so, so thinking about it in that way is, 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 is something to do. But um, yeah, I mean, I kind of interpreted the, as I said, the, uh, the inflation thing a little bit like these are, this is exactly what good central bankers should do, right? They, when everything else is going well, they should panic about inflation, even if there's no sign of it. They should worry about there might be a sign of it. Um, so, so on to Steve's point, time lag is um, weeks to the minutes. So about two or three weeks, um, I think three weeks for the, for the minutes, uh, lag to the transcripts is five years. Now, clearly the role of speeches, and again, we can apply this as, as equally to speeches, um, the, the role of the speeches in, in getting this information out there is key. There are others in the literature who actually think there's sort of more um, nefarious leaks, but you know certainly you know the, the sort of interviews that you would conduct as a as a policymaker would would reflect some of these uncertainties, and they would get out. Um, and, and, and Tarek, thanks for that suggestion on other. Like I said, actually we have <laughs> it's not we haven't just converged on methodology, and uh, although there is a few things that we've done in this paper that are that are attempts at sort of at, at high technological solutions to this they basically give you what you get with dictionary methods and dictionary methods are much easier to explain but i think we've also converged on co-author interactions in the sense that you know we're all having the same kinds of conversations about how we should treat the residuals and what we should do so like i said there's certain things like wars and even fiscal uncertainty that seems to turn up a lot in other and there's a debate amongst us about whether we should treat fiscal uncertainty separately. Uh, in fact, um, I presented a version of this with some of the other sort of angles of it at the AEA. And in that work, we had included the fiscal as part of economic uncertainty because I sort of thought it should be. If I was a policy central banker, I would think of that just as another source of uncertainty on the economy I'm, I'm facing. But again, we've had internal debates about whether it should be in or out or maybe separate. So yeah, we'll 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 have a we'll have a think um, about that. But other than that, yeah, thanks to everyone for the comments and, and and to the organizers for the great conference. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, so now let's move on to the third paper in the session. Sumudo, please take it away. Um, can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right, I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so I first want to thank the organizers for um, putting together a great conference and thanks for putting our paper on the program. Um, uh, it's a great audience to present this at, at. So the paper is Pricing Poseidon, Extreme Weather Uncertainty and Firm Return Dynamics. It's joint work with Matthias, who's in the audience, who'll answer questions in the chat, and Brigitte. So we're all somewhat aware that uh, natural disasters like hurricanes um, uh, snowstorms, droughts, and wildfires have uh, intensified in recent years. And there's a lot of um, interest and, and debate about understanding the impacts of such climatic events. Um, little is known about the uncertainty generated for firms by extreme weather events. And that's uh, somewhat surprising given that uncertainty has been shown in other contexts to have wide ranging effects. So if you think about policy uncertainty or micro uncertainty, we have shown that this affects firm investments, for instance. And I just want to be clear at the outset that when we say uncertainty, we mean expectation of future volatility as opposed to 19 uncertainty. Um, so first of all, a priori, it's not obvious that extreme weather events would generate uh, or should generate substantial uncertainty for firms. So you can think of the possible unpredictable impacts on 
uh, property, um, factories, local labor, demand, um, you know, trees falling on the, on the road, bridges being broken, supply chain disruptions and so forth. This can increase uncertainty. Uh, on the other hand, vulnerable firms uh, in particular could ensure, adapt or relocate away from risky areas, um, which may reduce uncertainty. So it's, a, it's an empirical question how much uncertainty is actually generated um, from extreme weather events. Um, so uncertainty as in you know, really bad outcomes or, or good outcomes. Okay. So um, on top of that, there's a, a, a lot of interest in understanding how climatic events are priced in financial markets. So uh, with climate change, uh, we get increasingly novel risks and uh, related to both transition risks and, and uh, physical risks. And there's debate about how this can impact uh, financial stability. So Carney in 2015 pointed out that if there's systematic mispricing, um, you know, under reaction or, or reaction, this can lead to sudden large um, price corrections that can be destabilized. Um, so in, in this paper, we're going to think about two questions. So does extreme weather cause uncertainty for firms? And how much? And do investors price extreme weather uncertainty efficiently, or is there a systematic underreaction or overreaction? We're going to analyze extreme weather uncertainty at the firm level using financial markets, and we'll present a framework, a simple framework to formalize ideas on the sources of extreme weather uncertainty. We think about two components of the uncertainty related to extreme weather. First is incidence uncertainty. So that's the uncertainty related to whether, when, or where an event uh, will occur. And the second is impact uncertainty. So that's uncertainty about how, uh, once the extreme weather event occurs, how it will impact firms. Our empirical setting is going to be single stock option price reactions around US hurricanes. And um, we're gonna look at changes to option implied volatility um, uh, relative to before the hurric uh, hurricanes or storm storms inception. Uh, implied volatility is a commonly used measure of uncertainty. Hmm. We're going to identify effects using a difference in difference setting. So that we have the pre post time dimension. And then we have firms located in the forecasted or realized path of a hurricane versus untreated or unexposed firms. Um, we're going to use firm establishment locations as opposed to headquarter locations to determine or just headquarter locations to determine uh, treatment. So our treatment variable will be continuous. Um, and importantly, we have multiple hurricane events with different landfall regions. So you know, the effects we estimate is not coming, uh, are not coming from a particular region or a particular um, you know, industry that's concentrated in a particular region. And you have firms being both in the controls for certain events and in the treated for other um, so just a quick picture early on to have um, kind of what we are looking at in mind. So this is showing a, a picture of uh, Hurricane Sandy um, uh, three days before it made landfall. So um, this is NOAA's, this is a representation of NOAA's forecast. You see the current location and the forecast up to five days ahead. And uh, you get a forecast about where it would hit and the intensity of the wind speeds and so on. So what we're going to do is use the raw data that underlies um, images like that in our analysis. So a preview of what we find. So before landfall, um, uh, so we find that investors pay attention to short-term forecasts and price in substantial uncertainty. And so prior to landfall, this uncertainty that's reflected in option markets reflects both incidence uncertainty and expected impact uncertainty. After landfall, um, when landfall uh, incidence uncertainty is fully resolved, options um, reflect uh, impact uncertainty and um, they reflect um, uh, large, they show large impact uncertainty. So implied volatility is over 20% higher, results hold across industries. And um, uh, interestingly, we show that in, uh, impact uncertainty resolution is slow. So these elevated implied, they stay elevated for up to three months. Um, which, if you think about it, I, is it's showing kind of a very slow resolution of the uncertainty after an event, uh, after an extreme weather event occurred. 
both before and after um, landfall, we find um, evidence of significant underreaction. Um, so systematic underreaction. So um, I'll go into more detail about that analysis, but effectively the exposed realized volatility is larger than the uncertainty expected volatility that we can um, get from the um, option prices. And this pricing inefficiency uh, diminishes after Hurricane Sandy, which was a particularly salient event. And finally, consistent with Merton um, 1987, um, which is a model that shows how under because of underdiversified investors, you can have idiosyncratic uncertainty or idiosyncratic volatility being priced. Um, we find that um, the, this uncertainty or extreme weather uncertainty is uh, associated with um, positive expected uh, stock returns for firms. So effectively, this, this um, means that extreme weather uncertainty is impacting the cost of capital for firms. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on the related literature. Um, we contribute to the uh, a nascent literature on pricing of climatic risks. Um, in the paper, we are testing the efficient pricing of climatic risk with both forecasts and realizations. We have multiple exogenous cleanly identified salient climatic shocks. And we analyze the second moment and we use, uh, we can show that we use forecasts and um, there's underreaction and learning about uncertainty. The uncertainty literature for this audience, I don't talk about at all. Um, in, the, in our paper, we are, um, uh, we're effectively contributing a comprehensive analysis of extreme weather uncertainty and, and um, thinking about a conceptual framework um, to uh, you know, formalize ideas about uncertainty on the extensive and intensive margins. And then finally, as I mentioned, we test, we have a unique, unique empirical setting to test theory uh, to, um, uh, to show a relationship between exogenous increases to uh, idiosyncratic volatility and expected returns. So just a quick overview of the framework. So suppose there's an extreme weather event H that's expected to, um, in, to hit at time T plus one. We um, model the uh, firm stock return um, with this equation. So the first component is just a random shock that's independent of the extreme weather event. And this component is the impact from the extreme weather event itself. So G, is just um, capturing the um, impact of the event and theta is capturing whether or not the event occurred. So um, theta is one if the firm is hit by extreme weather event and zero otherwise, and it's, it's effectively a linear one, one draw of a, a binomial where phi is the probability of incidence. <clears throat> so we can find the variance um, just to think about what this framework is. So if the firm is hit, um, or not, you can find out variance. So if it's not hit, it's just the baseline variance. If it's hit, you have the baseline variance plus the impact uncertainty. So here, sigma g squared um, represents the impact uncertainty. We can, um, for the variance prior to the event uh, hitting, we can com uh, combine the expected conditional variance and the variance of the conditional expectation to um, obtain this variance. So here, Again, the first component is just the baseline variance of the firm. The second component is the expected impact uncertainty or the impact uncertainty modulated by the probability of the event occurring. And then the third is the incidence uncertainty or the uncertainty associated with whether or not the event will occur. And intuitively, this is highest when the probability of the event occurring is 50%. And you can see that it's zero if the probability is zero or probability is one. When you have certainty about whether or not the event will occur, there's no incidence uncertainty. And just very quickly with this figure, I just wanted to illustrate. So on this um, x-axis, you have the probability of the event occurring. And here is the variance um, prior to the, <clears throat> the extreme weather event. So the red line here represents um, the variance if there were there was no incidence uncertainty. So effectively, you just have um, the total variance being the expected impact uncertainty. So impact uncertainty times the um, probability of the event occurring. 
um, anytime you have non-zero um, landfall um, incidence probability incidence uncertainty, you will have a curve like this. And uh, interestingly, uh, in, under certain conditions, you can even have the, the variance prior to the event being higher than the impact, the, the total impact uncertainty of the event. Okay, so um, on to the empirical design and data. So prior to landfall, we use, uh, so we we put together several novel data sets in the, in the paper. I'll go through this very quickly. Um, we use county level probabilities of hurricane level wind speeds from NOAA forecast. Um, and so our data covers 41 storms forecast. The forecast data we use is available from 2007. Um, it's going to, our, the forecast data includes storms that hit and also ones that dissipate out at sea without making landfall as hurricanes. Uh, for our analysis after landfall, we use the location and distance from the eye of a hurricane uh, to get the, the intensity of impact. And we have 33 hurricane landfalls in the US that hit the Atlantic and Gulf Coast since 1996. Um, we're going to identify uh, firms exposed and unexposed to a hurricane using establishment data from NETS. And uh, we're going to use uh, a, a change in IV relative to just before hurricane inception to um, you know, measure the extent of uncertainty. And we obtain single stock options data from option metrics and an average daily implied volatility measure, which we will call IVIT. So uh, for a firm for a particular day. Just to, uh, to quickly illustrate the identification strategy, so this is the temporal dimension. You have um, here the hurricane inception, right? So one thing to note here, say, unlike say an election or anything like that, in the pre-period, it's a, it's a clean control period. Like the, it, the hurricane appears suddenly out at sea. Before then, there's no uh, contamination from that event in the pre-period, so you have a clean control period. And then uh, you have landfall at pH. So in our forecast analysis, we will uh, look at a particular point in time in, in the forecast period relative to um, you know, levels in the pre-inception uh, or control period. And in the post-landfall analysis, we'll look at a specific point in uh, uh, following landfall relative to the pre-inception period. So this um, you know, allows us to clearly identify effects. Um, on, this, on the spatial variations, the other dimension, I um, wanted to illustrate how uh, we think about um, exposure. So this is illustrative. So we imagine we have three firms, A, B, and C, and uh, each of these squares represents a county in this grid. So we have firm A with four establishments here in different counties. We have some counties with no establishments and so on. And so um, if um, from NOAA, we can find out, uh, for instance, that, okay, so these five counties have a particular probability or, you know, minimum probability of being hit by um, hurricane force winds. And so this will give us a forecast exposure measure for each um, firm. So for firm A, two out of its four uh, total establishments are exposed to the forecast. So the forecast exposure will be 0.5 for firm A. Uh, for firm B, it would be three out of four. And then firm C has, uh, has no establishments in the uh, forecast um, counties, so their exposure is zero. So um, in that manner, we'll have a continuous variable reflecting treatment intensity that will range from zero to one uh, for forecast exposure. And then the landfall exposure um, measure is um, you know, effectively uh, and, and analogous will just use the counties that are exposed to the landfall region as the um, uh, treated counties and again get a continuous variable ranging from zero to one for the landfall region exposure for each firm on a particular day. All right, so um, what does the real data look like? So this is showing the um, uh, forecast for Sandy over time. So this is, um, sorry, four, four days before landfall. Um, you can see these are the counties that NOAA says has a greater than 1% probability of being hit by hurricane force winds. And as you go a step ahead in time, um, you'll see that this um, forecast is changing. And then 
you, um, NOAA is also uh, forecasting with higher probabilities as well. So um, this is uh, days before, two days before you um, have even some counties with greater than 20% probability, and then the day before um, you have uh, some counties that are forecast to um, experience um, hurricane force winds with greater than 50% probability. So we um, use these dimensions and, and data in this way. For um, landfall, as I said, we use the distance around the um, eye of the hurricane as uh, the you know, intensity of treatment of landfall. So this is showing the landfall region of Hurricane Sandy. The darkest region is within 50 miles of the hurricane eye. Uh, you have 100 miles, 150, 200, and so on. And uh, we have 33 of these hurricanes in our analysis. So this is Hurricane Harvey. And um, you'll find hurricanes that hit with um, uh, you know, high intensity all along the Gulf and Atlantic coast. And then uh, correspondingly, so this is our establishment data. So this is showing a county level map of the US where the darker um, uh, colors are where there's uh, economic activity concentrated. Um, and so what you can see is that uh, a lot of economic activity or, or, or major economic centers in the US are in the Atlantic and Gulf Coast. So we have a lot of uh, treated firms from these events. Uh, so quickly on the uh, summary stats. So, um, so I just wanted to show here that we have a large number of firms that are hit at some point. So hit being at least 25% of your establishments are hit at least once in the sample. Um, and um, also the hit firms are not significantly different from the total sample. Do we have five minutes left? Five minutes, okay, I just wasn't sure. Okay, so um, just quickly on the results, I already previewed them. So before landfall, um, we are, we're gonna run this regression and it'll, um, so effectively on the, uh, on the the dependent variable is the percent change in the implied volatility relative to the pre-inception um, point. And on the right-hand side, we have the forecast exposure uh, and lambda is the coefficient of interest. It's, so if it's positive and significant, that means uncertainty is increasing with forecast exposure and it will be a measure of both incidence and expected, uh, on, on, um, expected impact uncertainty. All right. so. Um, a quick show of the, the table here. So what you can see is a day before, this is one day before landfall. You can see that, uh, so lambda is positive and significant and it's increasing with um, the probability of incidents. Uh, you can have up to 20%, have up to 20% increase in implied volatility for a firm that's fully exposed. And similarly, you can do the analysis for two days before, three days before and, and so on. And you'll see significant um, uncertainty being reflected in option markets for these firms um, uh, it, you know, with the investors paying attention to firms. So if you look graphically, um, so this is what it would look like five days before, so four days before, three, um, two, and so on. So um, uh, it, you can see that uncertainty is increasing with the probability uh, of exposure. Um, I'm sorry, probability of the hurricane actually occurring. And um, these are very significant, um, uh, these significant measures. Okay, so we do a very similar analysis for after landfall. And so when you think about it, like when landfall occurs, all the incidence uncertainty or uncertainty related to landfall goes away and only impact uncertainty remains. So now with this regression, we can cap, uh, capture the impact uncertainty. And so here, um, again, we can run the analysis for different sets of firms, 50 miles being the most kind of intensely treated all the way to 200, mile, um, 200 miles as the radius around the eye as a landfall region. And um, we find that there is substantial uncertainty price. And so if I look at this, um, if we look at how this, uh, regression, if you run it through time after landfall, what you find is that the coefficient peaks at like 20% um, around here and reverses to pre-hurricane levels after three months. So effectively implied volatility stays significantly elevated for up to three months. 
Uh, so you can think of the, it taking that long for investors to figure out exactly which firms are impacted and how, and potentially kind of waiting for company filings and so on to understand exactly what happened. Um, okay. And similarly for the 200 mile radius also, um, you find that the implied volatility stay elevated, uh, but the peak is lower, the, the impact is, is lower. Impact downside is lower. Okay, so the, very quickly, I, I just wanna talk about the uh, pricing aspects that we've looked at. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna define the difference between the option implied volatility and the subsequent realized volatility over the remaining life of the option as a volatility risk premium. And so this spread is gonna capture how much kind of the difference between what the market um, expected volatility was and, and the, the realized, actual realized was. And so if this is systematically different for the um, impacted firms just after, you know, just because of the exposure to the hurricane, that would um, show a um, inefficiency in pricing. Okay, the, the, the dependent variable of the specification other than the dependent variable is similar to previous regressions. So we find that the average VRP prior to landfall is significantly lower for hit firms. So this is again, a diff and diff. So we're um, comparing to control firms and against the baseline for uh, the hit, uh, you know, each firm. So because there's a firm fixed effect. So um, the average, there's, um, this is evidence of underreaction and we find this after landfall as well. And then very quickly, um, we want to understand whether investors learn over time and a particular damaging uh, hurricane, for instance, could increase the saliency of hurricane strikes and lead to investors more efficiently pricing um, hurricanes in option markets. And so we test if the underreaction result changes post hurricane Sandy, um, which was a particularly destructive um, hurricane. We have hurricanes that are coming after it, before and after the Sandy. And a large share of US institutional investors reside in, in, resided in the landfall region. And so indeed we find that, so we have the baseline negative result and um, the uh, interaction coefficient is positive. So the inefficiency in pricing extreme weather uncertainty diminishes following Hurricane Sandy. And then the last result I want to uh, uh, mention today is that um, uh, we look at whether this heightened uh, extreme weather uncertainty lead to higher cost of capital for firms. And so this is based on this theory by uh, you know, Levy 78 and Merton 87, where they talk about how imperfect diversification or market segmentation can lead to idiosyncratic volatility or uncertainty being positively related to expected stock returns. Currently in, in the, as a pricing literature, the evidence is mixed. And so what we, uh, we exploit our unique setting where we have, we can identify exogenous shocks to the um, uncertainty exposure, or like the volatility of a firm, idiosyncratic volatility of a firm, to test this theory. So what we find is that the um, post-Sandy, the relationship between excess returns and um, idiosyncratic volatility is as predicted by Levy and Merton. So if you look at this, so um, in interaction, we have a very positive and, and significant coefficient here. When you sum it up, that this is you know, post-Sandy, um, the extreme weather uncertainty is priced in such a way in option, uh, in in markets such that um, there's a positive expected return uh, associated with exposure to um, a hurricane, meaning that the firms have a higher cost of capital. All right, so we have a bunch of other results in the paper. I'm not gonna go over um, additional results and robustness. I'll leave you with the conclusion. So we show that extreme weather events cause substantial uncertainty for firms across industries. Um, it suggests uh, potential real effects. Um, before landfall, um, people, um, investors pay attention. Um, it takes a while to resolve this uncertainty, up to three months. Uh, but we find that though investors are paying attention, but there's significant pricing inefficiencies. Markets underreacted to you know repeated uh, natural disaster events like hurricanes, and um, learning required a particularly disrupt destructive salient event like Sandy. And so this in turn raises concerns about the pricing, efficient pricing of novel risks caused by climate change. 
And then finally, uh, we find evidence that extreme weather uncertainty increases firm cost of capital. Um, and I'll uh, stop for questions. Thank you, Sumiko. I mean, there has been quite some lively discussions going on throughout the presentation in the chat box. Um, so if there are no further questions, maybe uh, it's time for us to move on to uh, the keynote speaker. And um, I wanna thank all the presenters today for sharing their work. And uh, I think I thank everyone for the very lively discussions. And I apologize for running over time. It's a, it's truly a real pain to cut the fantastic discussions short. So with that, turning over to you, Davide. Hello, everybody. Uh, good to see you. So many uh, friendly faces. Uh, and it is uh, uh, with great pleasure that I have uh, uh, the opportunity to uh, introduce Unique uh, to present uh, um, his work on world uncertainty, uh, including during COVID. Uh, to end in the best possible way this great conference. Nick, to you. Thanks very much. I feel terrible this is remote. There's like so many people I know that would love to go chat. Uh, there's been a series of great papers. I wish we had coffee breaks uh, to go and talk. So why don't I share my screen and just start off. Um, so I, I'm going to give like a review paper, basically. Um, so I... Um, I'm, I'm, it's not, it's not going to be particularly technical. Before I start, I should just thank, this has been fantastic. Thank the organizing committee. Thank Chelsea for being extremely organizing, organized and the organizing committee. And just know, just to flag, we every year for a long time with, with many people here have been running this event at Stanford, the site, a, a whole conference on uncertainty for two days. We canceled it the last couple of years because it was hard to do it remotely, but I'm hoping we'll do it next summer. So look out for a call for papers. My guess is we'll be back in person, I hope next summer so uh we'll, we'll restart again so um you know i hardly need to say this uncertainty is like clearly higher under covid um you know it's all this is what the whole conference is in many ways is connected to so i'm going to kind of review uh a couple of recent papers there's quite i mean steve davis brent uh davidi had uh, uh, quite a few of my co-authors are on the call i'm just going to kind of review stuff rather than present uh, one entirely new paper just to kind of go through stuff. It connects, as you'll see, to many of the papers we've been through. So there's a lot of measurement in this, and there's a huge discussion. It's been great the last two days on measurement issues. So I'll start with stock market volatility. This, in some ways, you know, we, we just saw in the la last paper exactly on using stock markets is a classic measure of uncertainty. It's what was, if you look at some of the really early papers like uh, Leahy and Whithead from what, 1986, I think, or 96, sorry. Uh, you stock vol. I used it in my PhD back in the 90s. The, you know, the classic measures, the VIX, it used to be called the VXO. This is implied stock market vol. I prepared these slides on Tuesday, and then suddenly the stock market went into a bit of turmoil the last couple of days. So I had to update it, redo it this morning. But uh, you can see that basically COVID generated this huge spike in stock vol that has mostly come back. You know, we're, most, we're basically back to pre COVID levels. So as far as the stock market's concerned, the uncertainty around COVID is completely gone. Um, and in fact, if you look going back to 1990, the beginning of where this data begins, um, COVID uncertainty was not as bad as it was in 2008, 2009. So that this is in late 08. I think in October 08 was the peak and it's higher than what we have now, at least on a monthly basis. So I, I'll show you other measures. Most other measures of uncertainty clearly go above 2008, 2009. But the stock market treated this as a, a bigger event in many ways than what's currently going through under COVID. So then what about newspapers? I'm not gonna to spend too much on, on time on this, but just to recap for those of you uh, that don't know, I have a paper with Steve Davis and Scott Baker on uh, using newspapers. Um, just to kind of recap, we basically use the 10 major US newspapers and we do something really simple. We just get monthly counts of the number of articles that mention economic or economy, one of six policy words um, and uncertainty. And we just look at the count, we normalize by the length of the paper, and then we have a normalized monthly index. So you can realize that this is funny as I was thinking as we're going through stuff and listening to Mike, Michael earlier, it's like, and Tarek yesterday, there's, and I'm, I know many people think there's definitely more 
you know, advanced and sophisticated ways to do this. We only just counted for words because we didn't actually have access to the underlying text. So in this, we had to fire search requests at newspapers' websites. And so when you're doing that, you can't say like, are these EP and U words close together? Are they in the title? Uh, you know, you can't do, you know, inverse frequency weighted, et cetera. So this is super simplistic, kind of forced on us by the fact we didn't have the underlying text. Here are the newspapers, you know, the, the big US newspapers. We've done other stuff where we've used obviously thousands of newspapers using Access World News and it actually looks pretty similar. So these big papers seem to roughly reflect what's going on across all US daily newspapers. So here's the EPU. It's also gone up, it's fallen. Uh, you know, so I used to, until recently I was saying the EPU hasn't fallen as much. The newspaper's still talking about COVID. In the last kind of month or so, policy uncertainty is based by newspapers has also dropped back. You know, I, th I think COVID uncertainty is higher, but we passed out of the Trump era. So these, you know, Trump was a, a kind of one person spike to policy uncertainty, as I'll show you later. And it's not just in the US. Trump was exporting policy uncertainty around the world. Um, that, so, you know, th this is the EPU is basically back down. Here's the longer scale EPU. You can notice on the longer run EPU, this is far harder than anything we've seen before. So EPU right in the peak of COVID was way above what we saw in the global financial crisis. So based on the EPU, as in newspapers, uncertainty under COVID is higher than anything we've seen going back. You know, really our index, our Monday index sites, 95. That makes sense to me. I feel, you know, having lived, I was born in 1973, having, you know, been aware as an adult, I guess, since at least the mid 80s of what's going on in the news, COVID feels far more uncertain than you know, anything we've seen before. So I think the newspaper index is a better rough index of what's going on in some senses, maybe than VIX, just because VIX is so focused on financial markets. But again, I use VIX a lot, so I don't want to put it down. It's great at high frequency. It's less clear of a very, very long run trends, how uh, good it is. Uh, you can look at a lot of other countries who are slowly adding them on. Um, the nice thing about newspapers, and again, we saw that, you know, and Tarek and Michael and others were talking about text data, is you can just drill down. So here's one thing. We just looked at subcategories. So you look at not only EPU, but other words. So for fiscal policy, do they talk about budget deficit and spending? You know, monetary policy, do they mention uh, other monetary policy words, et cetera? And what you can see here is um, under COVID, it was fiscal policy in particular that exploded the most as on policy uncertainty. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, health policy is very high. So, you know, all the discussions about spending bills, discussion about health. You notice monetary policy was not nearly as high and particularly trade policy was very low. So trade policy had spiked earlier under Trump. I mean, nobody's really talking about trade policy uncertainty right now. So text data is great for drilling down to individual drivers. Also more recently uh, with Thomas Renault, we've been working on Twitter, <laughs> scraping uh, tweets or, you know, hundreds of thousands of these. And Twitter, it looks in some ways similar. The nice thing about Twitter, you can see who's actually making the comments. So you can break it down by regular tweeters, you know, uh, particular individuals, famous economists, you know, for, well, I'm not sure there are any famous economists, but at least economists, uh, we can break it down by, you know, famous, you know, may, maybe politicians, et cetera. So, Twitter looks relatively similar-ish to EPU. This is a pay project that's ongoing. We're looking at various cuts by country and stuff. I'll just say that at least at a first stage, Twitter had a bigger spike under COVID, but otherwise I'd say uh, follows. Twitter was a big deal on Brexit. There were lots of people tweeting about the horrors of Brexit. As a, as a Brit, I share their fears about the horrors of Brexit, but um, it didn't show Brexit, didn't show up so much, at least in the US newspaper. So the third approach I'm going to spend a bit more time on is with Davide and Hitesh here. I, I, you know, I, I talk about this because this is uh, work that we presented less around, and it's a very similar text to data idea. Tarek mentioned, you know, connected to this yesterday, and he mentioned uh, we're using the Economist Intelligence Unit. So just to explain, the Economist Intelligence Unit is connected to the Economist magazine. It's spun out from it, but it's been going for a long time. They have stuff going back to the 60s. So they're a magazine. Well, I'm not really sure they're a magazine. They're a company anyway in London that publishes these quarterly reports, stuff that looks like this. And they actually, since the 90s, have moved, or since the early 2000s, to doing them monthly. Um, we're still going to use them quarterly because some countries still on a quarterly uh, 
uh, quarterly uh, calendar. So what they do is for more or less every country around the world, I mean, like over a kind of 140 countries, once a quarter, they produce this relatively standardized report that talks about in different sections what's going on in that country. And they're aimed at multinationals and hedge funds, you know, basically serious investors. This is not a media product. They're aimed at, you know, serious kind of people that would read the Economist newspaper, I think, if you look at this thing, it's that kind of level. It's not advanced, but it's certainly, you know, it's Wall Street Journal plus ton of readers. And it's quite long and it's quite standardized and it goes through multiple rounds of editing. We're going to use this to think about how many times the word uncertainty shows up and then what else is in sentences around it. So I've shown you an example for France. Uh, and, you know, in this thing, it's mentioned three times, uh, twice domestically and once internationally. So the nice thing about the EIU, I mean, again, it relates a bit to what Tarek was talking about earlier, is you can look at lots of different countries. So I'm going to come back to a global measure, but if you want an uncertainty measure for, you know, Congo, DR, uh, see in Congo or Gabon or, you know, Ireland or South Africa. Some of these countries like Ireland have, you know, reason or South Africa reasonably liquid domestic stock markets, but others don't. So I wouldn't say this is perfect. We're, only, we're looking at a quarterly report with 30 pages, but it gives a kind of rough measure country by country of uncertainty. Um, you can also, to some extent, compare across countries by how frequently the word uncertainty comes up. Again, it's far from perfect. You know, what's uncertain in Gabon, say, may not be seen as what's uncertain in the US. But at least if you do compare across countries, you notice that there is a decreasing level of the frequency of the word uncertainty when you go from low to middle to high income countries. That looks a lot like other measures like GDP volatility, exchange rate volatility. So low income countries tend to have just much higher levels of volatility and other measures of uncertainty. So it looks like there's some cross country as well as some time series identification. Or measurement. So here's the global average. Uh, we haven't yet put, I don't believe, I mean, I'm checking with David. I don't think we've yet to quite put out the latest quarter. You know, up until recently, the global, we were worried this index was just continuously rising. The, lo the lo last quarter, uh, which is uh, the, where are we now? It's the 2021 quarter one, because it takes a bit of a couple of months to come in. So basically the end of the first quarter of quarter one has dropped down to basically long run average. And I'll explain why in a minute, but you notice under COVID, there was a huge spike, a massive spike. Uh, and again, on this measure, just the frequency of the word uncertainty in economist newspapers around the world, we weight this by GDP. You can see recently, you know, is incredibly high and dropped down. So there are three reasons for the drop in the WI. Um, one is the US was a big X, you know, they had much as uh, Trump was starting a trade war with uh, China, he was, you know, under Trump, the US started exporting a lot of uh, uncertainty, at least as measured by the WI, and I'll show you that in a minute. A lot of other countries talk about uncertainty and mention the US in the same sentence. The second was Britain. Uh, you know, my homeland is same thing happened there. Britain doesn't basically never really figured in anyone's discussion pretty much until Brexit when it spiked up a bit. A lot of European countries were nervous about uh, follow on effects from Brexit. And then finally, a hardly surprising COVID. Uh, COVID uncertainty is, at least in the, in the Economist uh, reports, is calming down, at least in developed. Uh, this is wrong. It should say, at least in uh, developed countries and developing countries, clearly COVID is still hugely problematic. So here's US uncertainty spillovers. So the way we do this is around the world. So we look at a GDP weighted measure around the world, excluding the US and look at how often when countries mention the word uncertainty, they mention the US, United States, one of the Fed chairman or one of the presidents in the same sentence. And so it's a rough idea, it's not perfect, but it's a rough idea of how much the discussion of uncertainty is connected to the US. It looks pretty sensible. Um, you can see that there's, there was a you know, statistically significant bump under Trump, is it entirely him? I mean, you could debate how much is causal and how much is bad luck, but at least my personal reading without, you know, attributing to Hitesha here is, you know, the Trump administration was pretty unpredictable. Uh, you can, his policy is pretty unusual compared to prior administrations. And the policy making process as well is much more individualized and unpredictable. So you can see in this, the data here, there's a kind of a, a jump up under the Trump administration. Of course, it also coincides to some extent with the start of COVID and then it's dropped back down again. 
So in the latest data, 2021 quarter one, when countries talk about uncertainty, they don't particularly mention the US, that was not true two years ago. So the U UK also uh, figured pretty heavily for two brief periods in the rest of the world's discussion of uncertainty around the Brexit vote itself. And then that uh, somewhat chaotic period and they had multiple parliamentary votes. I don't know if you remember endlessly going in and out of parliament trying to figure out what's going on. Now Brexit has occurred and happened, uncertainty's dropped that down. It's not entirely zero. For those of you who are following what's going on in the UK, while they have left, they still haven't figured out all the small print. And there's actually quite a lot of major issues still on quite what's covered under the Brexit agreement for services, quite what was agreed under FISH, you know, et cetera. FISH in itself doesn't really matter, but it could start major trade wars of it. It's very, it's very um, politically sensitive. And then here's COVID. Uh, well, we had something slightly broader called the World Pandemic Index. It's just various pandemics. SARS was really the only one that majorly figures before you can see COVID. So this is basically the mentioning of uncertainty around pandemic words, and we have a whole list of words like SARS, avian flu, swine flu, et cetera. COVID is clearly the big one, which is not surprising. It's dropping back down. This is primarily dropping in developed countries. In developing countries, this is still pretty high. I mean, as you know, obviously, with the horrible tragedy in India, it's, it's hardly surprising COVID. In fact, the mentions is picking up in, in a number of developing countries right now. So overall, if you look at the World Uncertainty Index by income group, um, for advanced economies, things are really back to normal. You know, there's this you know, long belief that either the history is always certain. I remember Thomas Philippon in the, uh, when we used that, you know, it seems like so long ago, and the AEA is about five, six years ago, presented some great quote from somebody saying, you know, history is always certain, the future is always uncertain. So maybe it's surprising, but currently on the left, on the World Uncertainty Index, we're currently at kind of long run average for the advanced countries. For emerging countries, kind of maybe a bit above average, and for low-income countries, clearly above average, and because they're being ravaged by COVID right now. So that's that. I'll finally talk about, and it's going to be very linked to what Tammy was talking about, surveys. Um, so with Brent, who's on the call, Dave Altig, Nick Parker, uh, Amir Mikhikov, uh, Nick, Nick, uh, sorry, not um, Nick Parker, a whole, a whole group of us at the Atlanta Fed, Steve Davis in Chicago uh, and Stanford are running something called the Survey of Business Uncertainty. Um, it, you know, I was fascinated by what Cammy talked about earlier about the New York Fed asking consumers. We went down a slightly different route for how we elicited uncertainty based on this. The SBU was derived from earlier Atlanta Fed surveys itself. Uh, we were kind of testing since 2013, 2014, AB testing. We settled on an alternative specification, which is this, which is we first, as Cami mentioned for individuals, we asked firms uh, current and historic data, and then we asked them to forecast looking ahead. Here's some example numbers. Uh, what the lowest, low, mid or high and highest percentage sales growth they could see. So they put numbers in. This is a pretty narrow range, to be honest. Most firms, I was thinking this when I was preparing this, we should have a better slide, but most firms have numbers like minus five, minus one, zero, and then some pretty high numbers here. Um, and then on the next slide, we take the feed through these figures and ask them the percentage probabilities against them. So this is a five point scale. Uh, we did a lot of A-B testing. The reason we did it this way rather than giving them predefined bins because it turns out some firms have very, very negative average sales growth. Like if you're a furniture manufacturer and you know the US life is not good, you tend to have a lot of negative numbers here. If you're a high-tech firm, life is very good and your lowest bid may be plus 20%. So we couldn't really come up with a scale to encompass all firms. And if we get the couple of A-B tests, we gave them one, it ended up anchoring them to whatever we gave them. So in the end, we basically let them define what they think is low to high growth rates and then put probabilities against them. And as I'll show you in a minute, this has worked extremely well. So, you know, the survey is across US, it's across industries. Um, on the left, is this is the first moment. So average year ahead expected sales growth rate expectations. And this is the second moment, subjective uncertainty. On the left, you can see sales growth rate. These are nominal, of course. So if you take off roughly 2% inflation, the average firm in our survey is thinking to see real growth rates of what, four, 3%, which is, you know, makes a lot of sense. It's kind of roughly GDP growth rates a little bit above it, not massively. Um, 
during COVID, there's a huge negative drop and then a rebound. And we see this as kind of the buoyant economy now that, in fact, firms looking ahead uh, see growth rates above uh, long on average. On the right is uncertainty. Um, so uncertainty roughly doubled under the peak of COVID and has fallen back down mostly. Again, this feels kind of sensible. Uh, you know, it's hard to know. There's different measures. EPU went up about threefold. VIX went up about fourfold. In some ways, you know, firm subjective uncertainty roughly doubled. That maybe, uh, you know, it seems an appropriate number. It's a pretty large increase. If you notice, here's the, you know, there's various previous events like some of the trade wars. They don't really register much of a blip on here. Suddenly, you know, COVID is clearly the big shock. The nice thing about these surveys is you can also get um, distributions of expectations. So here, what we've done is we've taken every single firm's uh, forecast and collapsed it onto one invert commas representative firm. So we kind of massed across all of firms and we've given one representative firm probability distribution. If you can think of it as kind of one firm in a sense representing the US. So what we see is uh, a spread going from the 10th percentile, the worst outcome, which is often zero, sometimes below, up to the 90th, kind of in some ways, you can think of this as the best. You notice this thing completely blows apart during COVID. So here's the median, 50th percentile. This obviously drops, so here's the first moment effect of COVID, but you can see it's much more striking, the left tail in particular collapses. So people's worst case outcomes before COVID was about zero on average, or maybe minus three, four percent. Suddenly during COVID, you know, the typical firm's worst case outcome is minus 25%. Uh, slowly recovering, there's still elevated uncertainty now. There's still, I mean, as you can imagine with lockdowns and rolling, you know, slowly but relaxing, but still variable mask mandates, potential variant threat, et cetera, is still not entirely back to where we were. You can use this to do things like this. So you can look at uh, the change in variance, or it's the, obviously the square of subjective uncertainty. Um, and we can do it in terms of above and below 2%, which is kind of zero real growth. You notice, if you look at the decomposition events, most of the COVID uncertainty was, was downside. Again, hardly surprising. The upside, though, went up. So COVID did have some increase in the upside, as I showed you on the last slide. There were some firms, home delivery, uh, online firms, uh, cleaning firms, that actually surprisingly saw COVID as a positive. So there's a bit of an upside, but primarily COVID is a pretty heavily left skewed shot. <laughs> Done the same thing in the UK. So after Brexit, we, we started up, so it's called the Decision Maker Panel, uh, with Greg Greats, Phil Bunn, um, Paul Meason, uh, Pavel Smiantenka. Uh, there's, again, a Bank of England, Nottingham University, Stanford group. It's a very similar setup here. I have an example. We put a nice photo of the Bank of England, you know, the top of the building. Um, the bank thing, I, I, I could spend a, a lot of time showing fascinating results from there. I mentioned earlier that Brexit has now been crowded out to some extent by COVID. One methodological thing that's kind of interesting for the bank uh, is this. So in red, this is the subjective uncertainty scale. It's exactly the same as what I've shown you earlier for the Atlanta Fed. So we basically get firms five point distributions. We get their probabilities and we generate a subjective uncertainty. The red figure looks pretty much like what we see in the US. It rose, it roughly doubled, slightly less than double because the UK was already going through Brexit turmoil. So the baseline was higher. It's fallen back, it's not fallen back quite as much, but I mean, it's basically dropping back down. In blue is something completely different. This is a super simple question, which, you know, is the kind of thing that Gallup poll forecasters or, uh, you know, people that do one-off surveys or for folks like the conference board may be more likely to do, which is, um, it's the question on the right. It's a liquor type question, which is how would you rate the overall level of uncertainty facing your business at the moment? And it goes from very high, very hard to forecast future sales to very low. Future sales can be very accurately forecasted. So we have a liquor scale. We've been slightly more precise rather than saying very high to very low. We've tried to tether it to sales and about forecasting, but you can still see it's pretty subjective. What's interesting here is you notice this thing jumps up about the same amount, but has fallen significantly faster. My read on it is the problem with these, these Likert scales kind of work at high speed, a high frequency. The problem is over time, what I mean by very low or low uncertainty starts to be colored by what I've seen in my recent experience. So right now, you know, I, my guess is firms think back, look back a year and think now we're much more uh, certain, less uncertain than we have been recently. And so they're 
figures tend to go down. So it feels like you look at things may work. These very simple questions may work well. Again, in kind of changes, it's not clear that if you have persistent periods of uncertainty, they're going to remain elevated. I think people anchor to their recent past. But again, this is something you're looking into. It's kind of a methodological question to examine how to measure uncertainty. So the data is available for both of these at the DMP and the SBU websites. And this, with this, I'll stop. So um, uncertainty across pretty much all measures except the stock market reached all time highs under COVID. The stock market you know, had 2008, 2009 as slightly higher. So the first order is the same level, but you know, to the monthly peak was slightly higher there and the duration was a bit longer. Um, most measures are falling back, although mostly they're above pre-COVID levels, not all of them. So stock markets are back, uh, you know, are back to pre-COVID levels and the World Uncertainty Index for developing countries is about back to it. But for firms and for developing countries, it's still pretty high. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, developing countries seem to see the least pre-COVID drop. And I'll stop and uh, happy to take um, questions. Great, hey, thanks, Nick. I think we can open for questions. I think uh, Simon. Okay, great talk. Thanks, uh, Nick. Now, given that the evidence you show, the sealed revenue is pretty high and the uncertainty is pretty low, would you tell us that the recession ended, at least in the local countries in the United States? Well, I think, you know, my colleague, Bob Hall, I've been in so many, um, I don't know if anyone else is here in the MBR business cycle dating. Steve will know probably more about this than I do, but Bob uh, would say, I'm sure the recession already ended in the US because the recession is the growth rate. So Bob always talks about something else called the slump, which he says is kind of relative to trend. So I think in the levels, we're probably below trend, but the recession, I'm guessing, I don't know, is this the MBR called the end of the recession? I'm pretty sure it's going to do very slow. I mean, it, if not already, it must be about to do it very shortly because growth is massively up. Um, it is, I mean, it's a weird, it's weird that we're in an, you know, if, if you were beamed down from five years ago and landed now and saw people walking around, I mean, I was going to pick up a mask, you know, we all have these things like lying everywhere, masks and, you know, mandates and lockdowns and everything, and immigration controls. You would think that now is an incredibly uncertain period. Our firm level uncertainty still registers as pretty high. For firms, it's kind of unpredictable, but some of the other measures don't. And it comes back a bit to the question earlier from Mike about one event crowding out others. I, at least on uncertainty measures, on all, on average, we're pretty much close to pre-COVID, um, but not on the subjective. I, I don't know, Cami, for the, for the consumers, what do they show? Are the consumers back to pre-COVID levels? Um, yes, actually. So, so we have data that I didn't show you earlier because I don't have a pretty figure yet, but we have data through December 2020 and uh, the uncertainty of households dropped by then basically to before COVID. Um, and I, I mentioned this to, I think, in one of my comments in the chat. Uh, the, uh, if you look at the first moment of expectations. That's very interesting. And I was going to ask you, Nick, to comment about the first moment. So for households, if you look, say, at their answer about their own income growth, the first moment, you know, they're, they're optimistic before COVID and then boom, jump down. After COVID, they give you a much lower expected own income growth. Um, at the same time, you see this huge increase in uncertainty of households. What we see is though, even though uncertainty itself has dropped to basically pre-COVID levels by the end of 2020, the pessimism about own income growth as of December 2020 remain quite salient. So in terms of the first moment, the, the post-COVID drop in the first moment seems to still be there up until the end of last year, but uncertainty has de decreased. So I think households as of the end of 2020 were basically like, I'm pretty sure I know what's going to happen and what's going to happen is not going to be good. Like I don't expect great income growth, for example. So I was actually, this is. I did, you know, uh, COVID is like dog years under COVID. I mean, 20, December, 2020, it's like so long ago. Like I was super pessimistic in December, 2020. Now, many of you with the Wall Street Journal had a fantastic article on Monday about, you know, vacancy rates at their highest all time levels. So, um, I mean, the other thought, by the way, is coming back, the stuff I know Nancy's talked about a lot, which is about kind of the quantity versus the sensitivity to uncertainty. So it may well be that I, you know, now normally I always thought about quantities of uncertainty varying. And I know, you know, the various other people like Nancy talk about how much your, your sensitivity to it. It could be that COVID's really shifted our sensitivity to uncertainty. 
It's a bit like that liquor thing. People are coming new to it. They're so used to it that uh, my Israeli friend, my colleagues were saying, you know, we get so many terrorist attacks all the time. We're much more relaxed about it compared to, you know, what in Israel is a major attack is less of a big deal, will be less of a big deal because it's so frequent. And I don't know we have the same thing with events. I mean, that's another issue with some of these surveys, whether people downplay what's going on because they're so used to it. Nick, can I ask you, I'm sorry if I jump in front of anybody else, but can I ask you to tell us about the first moment of the projections for expected sales growth for firms, how that looks like over time? Uh, yeah, I mean, I can quickly share slides and I'll go back. Um, the, here's, uh, I mean, here's just the data. This is the data on the left. I see. It was very negative. And then it jumped up again. Um, okay. So unlike the households, firms actually move up the first moment. Well, here's, you know, here's January. So if I go back to December, this is probably the December point. So you could see in December, firms were less optimistic on average. And by now, this is probably the April point. They're more optimistic than average. I mean, this is a pretty big, you know, pre-COVID, this is the huge jump. But it's just COVID. A, it's the, the you know, I remember there's an NBR work, working paper by Georgia Primacera and someone else saying, how are we ever going to do VARs ever again? Because GDP growth rate is so massive that, uh, you know, it's going to, that, that, that one, two OBS in the COVID is going to dominate everything. So I think we just dropped that year. But yeah, the, I'd be love to, sorry, I should come, I see Georgia and Bern, others have questions. I would love to compare it to the household income stuff, but, you know, the, it'd be good to align them up. Thanks. I think it's uh, uh, Bo next, and then George. Oh, okay. I think actually George is first. Okay. But, but actually, this is a two-hander on uh, what Nick just shared on the difference, distinction between the level of uncertainty and the sensitivity to uncertainty, right? So, I, I mean, I, I do work in this area myself, but one thing that I really like have been wrestling with is that when we quantify uncertainty, let's say using tax data, right? It is, it is a mixture of both the uncertainty time variance certain version and as well as the, the, the amount of uncertainty we're trying to capture here, right? So Nick, you also mentioned on this, on this point, you also mentioned that we wanna compare a COVID being a much more massive shock uncertainty wise relative to GFC. And I, 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 my, my, my observation has been that the COVID is really also hitting like the psyche of the households quite a bit vis-a-vis -vis uncertainty, right? So, so in that sense, it might not be like really um, apple to apple comparison there. I just wonder what your thoughts might be in that area, just because I, I personally struggle with this distinction when we quantify uncertainty, especially using news data, right? If you think about all the media attention that also move with um, with the, 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 the mentality, so to speak, vis-a-vis uh, -vis uncertainty version. I totally agree. I mean, Nancy's long, yeah, I, we were talking about this yesterday ele electronically about trying to split it out in, in text. I think it's hard, but can you s split out the quantity of uncertainty versus the sensitivity to it? You know, there's, was it Campbell Cochrane was the classic uh, finance paper about you know, if you have habit persistence, how you can become more sensitive to it. I, I you know, it, VIX theoretically is supposed to be risk neutral. I know in practice it isn't. And there's this, you know, the risk premium and you see these smirks and things. Um, it is hard. I think in some ways you can take, you know, the total impact we can measure, splitting it into price and quantity is a harder issue. You know, I was going to have add a final slide and a laundry list of things to do. And this was one of them. And another is look at time profiles. You know, some stuff affects us now and some stuff affects us five years from now. But I think there's an enormous amount of, I, I have a good solution on Seattle. It's something I'm very interested in working on. I'm, I'm conscious it's a big issue and I'm not really sure outside of financial markets how to split this stuff up. Actually. George? So um, it, this sort of follows up on what Nick was just saying about, you know, today versus five years from now. And, you know, I, I sort of think about shocks as being like, you know, um, there's the size of the shock and the persistence of the shock. And, I, and you know, a lot of uh, things we worry about is these kind of long run trends that are, you know, coming out of the Great Recession, everything was about, are we going to be growing at 1% or are you grow at 4%? And, and so these measures seem to mostly be focused on short run kind of uncertainties, or am I somehow missing something? Because these, these, these uncertainty things kind of go up and come down. Is there, is there a way of sorting out the short run versus the kind of really long run risks and maybe it's kind of connecting it to things like the 
these long running surveys of professional forecasters that actually have these longer term forecasts. But I don't know, is, is there some, some way of kind of linking the horizon, uh, talking about the horizon that you're, you're really picking up with your, 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 these measures? Again, it's a great question. From financial markets, absolutely. So I'll give you a kind of very narrow uh, exp- you know, response in a broad one. For financial markets, for the implied vol, you have what's called the vol curve. I mean, you probably know this stuff, but I don't know how much everyone knows of this, but uh, there's a you know, implied vol from, but the VIX is one month out, but it goes all the way up to 10 years and it probably goes shorter, actually. I, I've just got data over the years. From, you can get it. I have a friend at Goldman Sachs who give us their internal calculations and you can calculate it yourself as well. You see, basically, if you break down the vol curve, there's two things that move around. About 80% of the variation is the level. So everything from one month to 10 years tends to move up and down together. But there's also what's called a slope. It's kind of like interest rates. You know, it's like the, you know, you get the level of interest rates, you also get inversions. So the slope is about 20% of the variance, but it is there and there are periods so, for example, you can imagine in 08, the slope went very negative. The short run vol went up, but long run vol didn't go up much. So the near term tends to move much more. Um, I've done some stuff. I mean, I use that to look at the effects of short and long run vol on different activities. And short seems to drive employment more and long R&D is kind of what you think. But you're entirely right. It would be great to do something on text. Text is like a mismatch. The survey we have with the SBU and the Atlanta Fed asks about one year ahead sales. So it can't look at different horizons right now. We pondered asking three and five. It just seems, you know, come back to questions asking Cami, it's like an overload. <laughs> These people, it's like a maths test. So um, it's precise on the horizon, but it's one year ahead, whereas text is very imprecise on the horizon. We have talked about trying to look at newspapers and other things. I don't know if anyone else, you know, Michael Turek or anyone that's used text it's hard because people don't normally say uncertainty about five years versus one month. Occasionally they do, but it's quite and free. I mean, your tariff stuff, for example, it strikes me as pretty long run, actually. Right. It's a big deal. And you notice it was there in 2018 and 19. I think these tariff concerns are going to come back on the front burner. But right now they were kind of pushed aside a bit by fears over COVID. Okay, thanks. So again, I think it's a great point. It's one of the other things of exactly to do. There's a number of measurement areas that financial markets are great on, but as soon as you step outside that, it's pretty narrow. Okay. This is uh, Tarek now. I have, to, I have two random comments, I guess. So the first is I knew that Marcus wasn't going to raise his hand, so I'm, I'm, so I'm just going to say it for him. So, so Marcus actually made, like I think, a lot of progress on exactly this term structure question from the text. Uh, in his dissertation, it's kind of being used for uh, trying to figure out how far in the future are monetary policy makers talking about uh, stuff. And this is sort of, I guess, like most salient in terms of like forward guidance and so forth. But I, I think if any, if anybody wants to, if anybody's working on this, you should definitely talk to Marcus about it. So it, it, I, I don't, I, I think there's a good chance that, you know, we could take his toolkit and apply it to other stuff. Marcus, okay. please send it around. I, I, sorry, you know, it's kind of you, but thank you for mentioning that, Tarek. It'd be great to see it. Thanks, Mark. I will definitely do. Yeah. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention is that what just struck me, Nick, when you showed the first and second moment recoveries, that is almost exactly what you get from the conference calls. So uh, if you look at COVID risk versus COVID sentiment, you get a much faster recovery in the sentiment. Like you basically at the end of last year, we were like pretty close to like even again in terms of first moments, but the second moment is lagging behind. So Great, we that's... should like, we should line, I mean, you could, in fact, I think we talked about it offline. For the U- Bank of England, we have a large sample. You can actually probably line these firms up. There's massive sensitivity about publicly listed firms' forecasts for their own sales. But um, yeah, they've been basically in the UK and the US, these are on average large firms. They're mostly private, but it's good to, it'd be good to cross compare this by industry as well. I mean, you hope they'd line up, I agree. Any more questions? I think we have time for uh, last one. Yeah, if I, can I just, uh, so I, I, I was just gonna, uh, Marcus, can you send it to me as well? So I, I've just, I've actually just, uh, I've just finished a paper with some uh, other co-authors uh, specifically for the, uh, as part of the ECB review of strategy where we, we developed a, a, a methodology, which uh, I hadn't seen your work, but uh, hopefully they, 
do similar things, um, but hopefully not that similar, um, which, uh, which exactly tries to measure uh, the temporal dimension of text, which, which actually it turns out is much harder than you would think, uh, at least that was our experience. And so um, it'd be good to talk, but, but I, I actually, Love Nick, I, I agree. I think this is, this is something, this is, so I've always, when, when I, we've been doing this, I've always been talking about the three T's of text, so you have the topic, the tone, and I thought the temporal dimension was always the bit that was missing, particularly because I look at monetary policy all the time and it's so central to that, but I think it right. matters in load of other horizons. So um, yeah, if, if, if anybody, uh, I'm going to talk to Marcus, but if anyone else wants to talk about it, I can send you a copy of my paper, the draft. That, that would be great. I have to say, we were literally this week uh, talking with Stephen Hansen and Scott Baker and others, we were upon, I was just thinking it was so hard. I'd kind of was like, not sure how to make progress on it actually. But. I think, I think, I don't know if Marcus will agree, but the, the hardest thing that we found is that, you know, you might think that future tense is one way to get, you know, at the very basic level, talking about uncertainty in the past or the future would be one way, but even future tense doesn't do it because there's a lot of times people talk about in the present tense, they talk about something in the future. Um, but then there's a lot of things like just matching categorical references to time, which really help a lot. Like, you know, next year, medium run, long run. You know, these are these are, you know, it just it, it's, it's a bit of a grind, but it is possible. No, it's great. And again, just to reiterate what I said at the beginning, we'll put out another call for papers for site. But site, I, you know, is very I I'm a big fan of like measurement stuff in uh, because it seems like so much of the challenges and uncertainty is just measuring and all of the discussion has gone on trying to figure out what's going on with you know quant price and quantity short and long run you know different drivers etc so. yes we are on time so this has been great uh thanks for that's much. the italian influence davide you've kept yeah, us right and both. <laughs> so i think uh uh we're on time so now yeah, it's uh, great. Uh, to great. Simon Thank to you, guys. It. okay uh I think I got to say a few words uh, to close it, all right? So let me first thank our virtual audience on behalf of programming committees and local organizers for your participation in this conference. Uh, let me extend my heartfelt thanks to our speakers, Nick, Steve, uh, Martina, George, uh, Tarek, Kami, uh, Michael, and Sumudu, right? Did I mention anybody's name? Okay, uh, for your impressive contribution to this year's conference. And uh, you give great talks and inspiration during this challenging time. And uh, I also thank, like to thank my uh, local organizers, uh, Bo Sun is here and uh, David Afaseri and John Haytash cannot be here, but really for their cooperation and support over the last two years. And uh, to my program committee members, uh, I have to say that because they did a hard job, very difficult task to select six papers out of more than 130 submissions. Wow. Right. Uh, so please uh, turn your uh, video, if I call your name, uh, Wojak, I see you, see you here. Thank you. And Lohan, Claudiana, and uh, Rafala, Svalena, Svalena here. Okay, uh, and Marcelo, Emilio, Chiara, uh, really thank you for your effort. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank my Dean for giving this uh, Dean Friedman opening remarks, and hopefully we meet his expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, I think we're gonna all thank uh, Chelsea Anderson, right, for helping us to hold this conference. Uh, we cannot do without you. Okay, so that's it. We look forward to seeing many of you in person in the next conference. Stay well and be safe. All right, thanks everyone, bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye.